Hello, beautiful people. I am Oliver Perrin for Semiagog, joined uh, for this episode by Rupert August, who is uh, kind enough, has been kind enough to agree to come on and share uh, some of his recent researches and uh, his observations uh, related to the Okhrana which I suppose in the most superficial sense you could refer to as a kind of uh, Tsarist uh, secret police. But I don't know uh, very much about the subject, probably not much more than, you know, the person on the street does. Uh, so I look forward uh, to learning more. Rupert August has a, a Twitter account. Recently, he was posting um, tweets about this. Uh, at least one very interesting thread about it. So I would recommend you follow him over there on uh, Twitter. Uh, in fact, I've put links for uh, some of his uh, online spots down below in the description. There's a, a blog with uh, interesting observations, writings, and uh, surprisingly, um, not because I'm surprised by him having created good poetry, but uh, coming across any good poetry is uh, generally surprising. There's some there's some good poems over there. Uh, and he's got a YouTube channel as well. So um, yeah, uh, before I uh, introduce him and allow him to speak further for himself, uh, I do want to uh, thank everyone for joining us. Please do follow this channel, Semiagog, as well as A Safer Space. You can do that here. Uh, you, can do, uh, you can do that over on BitChute, uh, the Semiagog channel. Uh, but not the safer space one is available over on Odyssey. There's also Telegram, there's Gab, there's Twitter. Um, please follow me on all of those other platforms. And as always, I thank the Praetorian Chads who make this possible, the ones who support this channel. Um, thank you very much to all of you. Uh, yes. Oh, and buy my books. There are links for my book of uh, links for my book of poetry as well as uh, my um, sci-fi um, foray. Uh, down below, you can find those on a Amazon. So that covers uh, the shilling at the outset. Um, uh, so yes, Mr. Rupert August, welcome. Uh, I've seen you around. Uh, very interesting guy. I recommend everyone check you out. But for those who uh, have not yet um, come across your stuff, um, please introduce yourself and tell people what, where they can uh, find your things, anything I might have missed and uh, anything uh, they should know that I forgot. Uh, hello, thank you for having me. Um, the only thing I would say that you've missed, uh, thank you for your kind words, I should say, about uh, what I have produced so far. Um, the only other thing that you've missed would probably be on Praxarchy, and that's where most of my uh, more recent essays and articles are going. Um, but yes, there's a lot of my more legacy content over on my uh, website. And funnily enough, that's kind of writing an, uh, an article there for my, for my original website is sort of how I came onto this topic and I've just sort of kept kept, uh, kept diving on since then. But probably where I'm most active would be yeah, Twitter. Twitter at the moment, that's, that's kind of where my, most of my thoughts are going. But going back, so uh, secret, secret police would probably be a very good way of uh, describing the Okrana, just to jump straight in. Um, in a lot of ways, that okay. probably... Okay, well, be... then, shall, uh, sorry, shall I just uh, follow along behind you? I guess I'll just uh, post things on screen that I find that will seem uh, suitable to provide yes. uh, visu visual aids. Very good. Yes, please. Very sorry, good. sorry, I, uh, sorry, didn't mean to jump again. No, not at all, not at all. Please go on. Well, so, uh, as I said, the Okrana are, in a lot of ways, pioneers of what we would consider a lot of the modern sort of secret police methods to be. Um, Probably you can. I would say that you can draw the lineage of it from two two different places. One which would go back to Ivan the Terrible, perhaps. He had the uh, Oprinniki, I believe they're called, um, who were a, a group of uh, sort of more lowly, non noble, typically um, sort of agents who would work directly on his behalf. Uh, on behalf of the Tsar, and they would act as like a private a private army uh, for him to essentially work against nobles that he didn't necessarily trust. So that's kind of where I would say this idea comes from in the Russian context, but it kind of received renewed interest uh, over a couple of uh, incidences, one of which being the uh, Decembrist revolt, which was in, I believe, 1821, possibly. Um, might have been a little bit, uh, a couple of years later, 
Yes, looks like 1825. 25, rather, sorry. Yes. Um, so what happens here is the many of the uh, officers who had been radicalized by a combination of uh, exposure to French ideas during their uh, stint in, over in the continent where French newspapers and such had managed to gain sway, as well as the uh, French many French deserters who had been left behind. So a lot of them ended up, so a lot of French uh, revolutionary influenced soldiers ended up being taken on as, uh, among other things, tutors. And they became uh, sort of embedded into Russian society from being uh, basically left behind. Some of them went back and formed the uh, formed in, formed the cadre of Napoleon's new army when he returned for his 100 days, but a lot of them stayed behind and started uh, sort of spreading uh, spreading their ideas amongst the Russians. But I mean, to be fair, there'd, there'd already been a, a good amount of interest in this topic uh, going back further. So you could talk about people like uh, Peter the Great and Catherine the Great, who were who were liberalizers in uh, in their own sorts of ways before Russia sort of turned against that, that idea. Yeah, Cath Catherine the Great actually inviting Voltaire to come and, you know, hang out and, uh, and you know, brighten up her conversation, right? Yes, exactly. But uh, even, even that aside, she had a... a, a Bit of a separate interest as well, uh, and she tried to. There's a there's an amusing story actually where she tries to introduce more liberal reforms and local uh, democratic or pseudo democratic governance. Basically, she was trying to get the get to local bodies. Uh, I can't remember exactly what they were called now, um, but uh, she was basically trying to get more more input from the from the lower levels of society into uh, helping her govern. Um, but because they, because many of them uh, thought that it was a kind of uh, a loyalty test, essentially all they could sort of convene to do was to award new titles and honors and honorifics onto uh, onto Catherine. So she kind of got quite disillusioned with the idea very quickly. Yes, I, I suppose she was insulated uh, by her importance and the uh, respect in which she was held. The fear, yes, yes, in a lot of ways. Um, but aside from that, you could kind of also think about Russia having having been already structured in a in a bit of a militaristic kind of way. Um, so uh, a lot of the structure of the state had already been sort of turned into like a, a more concrete uh, corpus. You could say they um, started structuring everything along military lines and even tried to create entire settlements that were. Uh, regimented in a in a in a very like militaristic traditional sort of way, uh, and that was in the late eighteenth century, I believe. But it might there may have been schemes to do that earlier. So almost there was an attempt, uh, which sort of almost culminated in uh, the efforts of Nicholas the First to kind of turn Russia itself into what like a giant army. And uh, what you'll find if you read about um, later periods is that uh, even people like many many people in the civil authorities like in the civil hierarchy have military ranks basically because so much of so much of everything had been had been essentially militarized but it kind of meant that everything sort of came under the purview of the state and this this is going to be relevant later because for example when peter the great was on his grand tour uh, sort of trying to get inspiration as to how to modernize russia uh, he was quite taken by anglicanism in the uk well, well in, in England, more specifically, um, he quite liked the idea of the, you know, the ruler and the king as the uh, head of the religion as well. And so there was there was some efforts under his under his jurisdiction. But even even before him as well, actually, under his uh, father, I think it was Alexei, uh, there was there were already some attempts to sort of modernize the uh, the church in some fashion. But kind of what that meant was uh, the church leadership couldn't act particularly independently. Um, and it meant that you know, like dissenters, religious dissenters also became uh, political dissenters, much in the same way that the, uh, in, the, the English Revolution sort of uh, tracked in a, in a similar sort of way. So dissenters from the authority of the church were also dissenters of the king. Yes, and that's an interesting thing that a friend of mine observed about the United States as well, you know, calling into question um, the role of the English monarch as head of the church and, you know, Anabaptists and the rest fleeing to the new world, that quite neatly opened up the gates for them to imagine that the king could be dropped altogether um, simply because he'd already in a quite a revolutionary sense been um, uh, you know considered no longer the head of the uh, the spiritual order you know on earth yes exactly um, they kind of through the process of well in the English case just as a quick digression they, they almost 
Um, they get themselves into the situation where they've divorced the, the king from the state. Um, in matter of fact, before they figure out the legality of it, they literally get into court and uh, and they realize that they don't actually have a, a legal or almost philosophical justification for separating the uh, the king from the nation because they are they are trying the king for treason. But the king simply, you know, this being Charles I, simply asks them, by what authority can you possibly try me for treason? I am the, you know, I am the state, I am the nation. They didn't really have a very good answer for that, so they just sort of went, went ahead with it anyway. And then after the fact, they kind of they they kind of established that oh okay yeah maybe I guess you can separate the uh, the king from the uh, from the nation because we're still here even though the, even though we've already killed the king and dethroned him. But wretched revolutionaries, yes, 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 of course. Um, back to Russia though. So the other place that that uh, the origins of the Okrana come from would be the. Uh, a lesser known organization that I discovered a little while ago now, and I've got a thread about them very briefly, um, even though there's really not that much concrete evidence for them, called the, uh, translates to the Sacred Guard. And they're an organization of all sorts of, unfortunately, I don't think you'll find anything on Wikipedia uh, about them. <laughs> but um, yes, essentially, uh, they are a group of essentially collecting up all the different royalists, uh, yeah, royalists and, and loyalists in the wake of the assassination of Alexander II uh, to strike back by any means that were at their disposal, both legal and illegal. And so they were a secret, almost like a secret society within the government, including a lot of members of the uh, the government and, well, many of which were actually quite junior. And so you see almost like a who's who of who's going to be relevant in the Tsarist government later on, even though the entire thing is sort of taking place a little bit, uh, a little bit before a lot of these people are in their prime. So you get people like uh, Sergei Vita, um, Stolypin, Pupin and Ostev, um, and various members of the uh, imperial family, including uh, Alexander III, who, who lent a lot of funding to the whole uh, escapade. Essentially, what these guys seem to have done is, is almost act as like a, uh, again, like a secret, uh, a secret society. They weren't they they may have done some assassinations. It's really hard to tell. They may have done some uh, espionage. Almost the only source that we have for their existence is uh, the memoirs of Sergei Vita, who was not particularly uh, closely entwined with the organization. Um, but he kind of you know says that they exist, and he says he was given some assignments, but it didn't really come to much in the end. So it seems kind of like a Walsingham kind of vibe, like the Star Chamber turned it over to him, and uh, Walsingham just did it all sub rosa. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think this, this, by my reading anyway, especially if if this organization did actually exist, and there's some reason to think that it did, even though all of the all the documents all the documents were supposedly destroyed when it was uh, when it was dissolved, was quite fairly shortly after it was uh, after it was founded, and the initial sort of panic of the assassination of the Tsar had subsided, and um, the autocracy had been retrenched. In particular, by Pobedonostev. So again, it gives some reason to think that all of these people were were sort of um, Cooperating in in order to try and make sure that the the authority of the uh, the Tsar could be maintained and that the revolutionaries wouldn't uh, you know get any get any more than they'd already taken. And you know? this was this was uh, after the assassination. The after the, you know the second successful attempt was that of Alexander the second. Do I have that right? Say again, sorry. Uh, that was after the assassination of Alexander the second. Yes, uh, indeed. In the eighteen eighties. Yeah. Yes. Because they had yeah. tried earlier in the 1860s, if I remember correctly, right? Yes. Um, admittedly, I lose I lose track of all the different uh, attempts because it comes up so oh, much, right. uh, especially when right. dealing with the the Okrana themselves. They they foil quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of different attempts. Um, sure. So even even before this, uh, I believe it was under Nicholas the First actually that uh, so that would be Alexander the Second's father uh, that you have the founding of the Third Section, which is a it basically is a secret police, but it's it's a much more official appendage of the uh, like the the state and police apparatus, and it doesn't really get into too much uh, heterodox me methodology. But uh, there's a uh, an inspection done by I'm afraid I don't remember who um, who who basically suggested that uh, the entire thing was completely inefficient, rotten. They had they they were useless. Uh, basically just wasting money 
And to top it all off, they had had a confirmed mole who was who was uh, representing the uh, you know acting acting as a double agent uh, on behalf of the revolutionaries to subvert the third section. Uh, and this is quite um, well foreboding I'd imagine of, of what is to come. <laughs> Right, I imagine it 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 means that they have a security that's about as tight as a sieve because it would uh, presumably anyone who played any role in this would be high ranking, right? And high ranking presumably of a of a of some kind of an important family. So I guess we're seeing the the same kind of thing where you had um, extremely revolutionary, let's say in quotes, forward thinking, um, progressive minded people who were uh, princelings themselves. It, it brings to mind people like uh, uh, Kropotkin. Um, ba basically, that there, there were many sympathetic figures among the elite. Would that be safe to say for these revolutionary ideas? Yeah, definitely. Um, admittedly, the, uh, the royal family itself, the imperial family itself, seems to be pretty good about this, especially compared to uh, someone like the Bourbons. So the Bour Bourbons are, are quite famously... Uh, schismatic in this regard between um the you know the Orleanists and the the mainline house of Bourbon su supported by the legitimists this becomes sort of like an ongoing problem towards the uh the end of the ancien regime over there but aside from the very end where you get one or two figures that are potentially trying to maneuver for putting themselves in power at the head of a more liberal government you don't really have the same level of uh support of of revolutionaries in uh, among the Romanovs to that to that right, Right. So you get <laughs> nice. So you have uh, you have figures like Alexander the Second himself, who, if I, I remember correctly, he was uh, he, he was uh, quite liberal uh, early in his reign, freeing the peasants and that sort of thing. Um, but but the, I suppose that's about as far as it goes. Uh, well, so earlier on, you do have some more li some more liberal uh, figures. Um, but I, I guess more more to the point is uh, that the Romanovs don't quite scheme scheme against each other in the in the same sort of way until you get to the very very end. It seems, or at least it's not not no scheming in a way that is uh, particularly significant. Ultimately, it doesn't really come to right. much. Um, but yes, you do get you do get individuals like Alexander II, who you might call something something like a, a liberal. But uh, again, in the Russian context, it can be difficult, especially in cases other than. Um, Catherine the Great, because, well, it, it, it's almost always just in service of the army. So Alexander II in particular, he uh, he inherits the Crimean War from Nicholas I, um, and it's not going terribly well. And uh, ultimately, it becomes a very damning mark against almost the entire legitimacy of the, uh, the Russian state, because everything had been militarized. And basically, the path to success in any area was to get a mil military man to do it, essentially. So if the military isn't doing its one job, uh, then you're simultaneously, um, what's the word, uh, delegitimizing essentially the entire state. Because, you know, it, it, at that point, uh, like prior to the Crimean War, if you need any problem solved, you get a mil military man to do it, as, as I said. So basically all positions in government were filled by military men. And the way that you get ahead in in life, essentially, in Russia, is to join the military and uh, rise through the ranks. Yeah, it's very interesting because it goes back to things. We, well, arguably, anyway, if you want to dig, dig uh, deeply into it, um, in the past, you know, the Mongol state, which of course incorporated uh, areas of Russia for some time, um, was entirely militaristic. Right? It was bannermen. That was how it was organized. You know, and the diplomatic passport was a military passport. The organization for the state and society was fundamentally military. And at the time, this is all um, beginning to show cracks and fissures in Russia. It's precisely the time that in the West, you're beginning to see a distinct division happen that I often remark upon. And I, I don't find many people think about uh, in, it's certainly in the American right wing where everyone's constantly talking about how they wish they had a, a beautiful militaristic hierarchical society. You know, we, we set up a system where we had two things running in parallel, the one being the liberal society with habeas corpus and, you know, human rights and these sorts of things. The idea that the individual is sovereign in at least some respects, private property. Um, but we kept uh, in parallel the break glass in case of fire. Indeed, we do today, though it's being subverted thoroughly. Uh, the military system in parallel, and we can shift from civil law to martial law to military control. Um, and we had those two systems running in parallel, which, you know, arguably gave us 
um, some flexibility, some paths for advancement, uh, you know, based on merit and skill uh, uh, outside of the sort of stifling hierarchical structures of the military. But in Russia, they did not have that. And apparently, as you're saying here, uh, the cracks began to show. To be fair, especially on the legal side, they do, they, well, they did They did still have this. Um, and so it may come up later that uh, one of the uh, mechanisms for dealing with the 1905 revolution was that they would impose martial law all over the place, have the army move in, and uh, people who were, you know, quite obviously revolutionaries from the perspective of the government would be, you know, as, essentially summarily executed or, you know, have, have some much more uh, summary punishment meted out uh, rather than going through the whole process of uh, of the bureaucratic civil law code which they actually did pretty good i mean especially according according to some people at the very least uh, the okrana was very good about maintaining uh, its legalism ah the appearance of it at least okay so it wasn't as strict uh, a or, or there was still a, a division into these components just not as much as the west so yeah they could still roll in and and throw down a drumhead court martial Yes, yes, exactly. Um, although uh, until 1905, it doesn't really happen all that much, as far as I can tell. And, and then they're just sort of using that all over the place as the, mecha as the mechanism, essentially, to uh, uh, crack down when the when the Okrana fails. Well, uh, you know, it fails in a, in, a, in a manner of speaking, anyway. Uh, so yes, to get back to to get back around to the Okrana, we've kind of covered now uh, the end of the third section very briefly, uh, and so you get on to. 1881, when the uh, the Ukraine was formed, essentially in order to get around this uh, this problem of the their very inefficient predecessor and um, the lack of of effective uh, maintenance, well, uh, security basically. You know, they were letting in revolutionaries. The entire thing was very porous, and by that point, the the revolutionaries were kind of winning the arms race. So they set up the set up the Ukraine, and initially they stick to fairly tame measures by uh, by the standards of what they later got into but initially uh, and they kind of keep this division going forward they have uh, what's called uh, i believe it was the external section uh, which deals with things like uh, opening opening and reading of mail monitoring um, and uh, and sort of like shadowing figures who they believe are revolutionaries uh, or you know who indeed they have confirmed are revolutionaries um, and actually, there's a there's a funny digression on on that point because at some some points there would be uh, revolutionary groups that were trying to or, or group leaders of cells, let's say, who didn't want to meet in person because they thought it was um, you know not necessarily a good idea from a, from a uh, security perspective. Uh, and so they would have an in intermediary or a go between. And so in these cases, as as well as a couple of others, uh, notably, but. Uh, most amusingly, in, in these cases, they would the Okrana would use a a man like an agent to follow and uh, and sort of shadow the the person who was acting as the go between, but do so in a way that is very obvious. So the the person being shadowed is very aware that he's being shadowed and watched all the time, uh, and so by doing that, they would essentially spook him out of uh, out of continuing his job, and so they would force the the leaders of these two cells to then communicate with one another more directly or meet directly and then that's how they can catch them quite an amusing little uh, way of going about yes. things i think cunning yes it almost makes one want to uh, go through all the historical accounts of these secret forces and uh simply abstract uh, a collection of techniques that are attested across them you know not just the okrana you could go from walsingham all the way forward you know i'm sure there are even earlier ones but um yeah, it would be interesting because uh, doubtless many of these practices are uh, still used today, right? Pioneers. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I'm uh, I'm reading a book a book at the moment that uh, goes into some of the some of the details by one of the later um, heads of the Okrana called uh, Vasiliev, and uh, he's writing this from uh, exile as an emigrant already uh, after the Bolshevik Revolution, and um, essentially. There's just there's all, all sorts of interesting uh, things that they talk about with regards to how they even, well, for, for example, just even how they select men to to operate in the uh, the external section. For example, um, they typically recruited men who were used to the discipline. So they, uh, yeah, it looks looks like you found him. Um, 
yeah, so they, they would recruit men who were used to the discipline, which would typically be uh, former NCOs. Uh, and uh, that usually assured that they had a good amount of loyalty because the army tend to, tended to be loyal throughout most of this process and, you know, right, right up to the end, really. Um, but they also had to be uh, very diligent about how they, like the area in which they operated. And so, although early on they stick to a few major cities, you know, St. Petersburg and Moscow, Moscow and uh, Kiev, I believe, notably, but then eventually after um, a couple of other figures sort of uh, bring in some innovations, they start moving into more of the uh, the localized areas as well. But yeah, so to start off with, in these in these areas, they would have to be very like very much able to get around the city and know all of the uh, all the sort of best spots and like know the location inside and out. And so, for example, they had to be aware of every house that had entrance and an entrance onto multiple streets. So if they knew they, they knew that if they were tailing somebody uh, and they went into one of these particular houses, there was a, an, a way that they would be able to get through to another street. Or alternatively, if they needed to use uh, what, one of those kinds of routes themselves to you know, essentially cut someone off who might be who might be trying to escape. They had access to all of these different uh, routes and thoroughfares that uh, you know potentially anybody who was not completely off with all with all, all these arrangements uh, would not necessarily be quite so privy to. Also, as an aside, they uh, they had a blanket ban on recruiting um, Poles and Jews because they considered them just inherently subversive, which is quite interesting. So aside from that uh, side of things, um, which might come up a little bit later, but frankly, it's a little bit less less interesting. Um, they had the uh, internal section, uh, and the internal section, which was uh, more concretely established by a guy that we'll come back to called Zubatov, um, they were mainly tasked with providing information more uh, more from the inside. So it would be the recruiting of. Uh, members of existing revolutionary groups who wanted to either, you know, turn cloak or simply provide um, information uh, and, you know, essentially snitch for um, for a bit of extra money or just to sort of get their own back against uh, somebody who would who had wronged them. So quite often they would there would be a situation where somebody had been um, stiffed for money that was that they thought was owed them, uh, and so they would uh, try and get them re recoup the money by working with the Okrana instead. Initially, they tended to like to only operate uh, in conjunction with men who were fairly low down the um, uh, the hierarchy. And the reason for that being predominantly that uh, as kind of becomes a bit of a factional point later on, because this isn't a point that's universally held and uh, it becomes quite well an issue of deadly consequence later. But um, Essentially, they think that if somebody is at the peak of an organization and knows knows everything, then they can't necessarily trust the motives to the same degree. So the suspicion is that uh, if somebody is, you know, the head of any particular organization, any particular revolutionary organization, uh, then they might be continuing to be out for their own their own ends, in as much as they are trying to uh, help help the state because they actually genuinely believe that the uh, the revolutionary cause is you know, evil. The recruitment of, of, of some of these types of figures, though, is, uh, is quite interesting because uh, Zubatov himself, one of the ways that he comes to prominence is... Uh, so I'll, I'll just tell his story, actually, very briefly. Um, essentially, he is, as far as I can tell, basically just a, uh, a curious a curious young man. And he just uh, reads a little bit more than uh, the state would like him to at first. So he becomes associated with certain literary circles uh, that are more revolutionary in nature. But when he is confronted about this, he decides that he's going to uh, work with the Okrana because he has nothing inherently against the, uh, the Tsarist state. And so he becomes an, uh, an informant of sorts, but he is a much more enthusiastic uh, asset to them. Eventually, you could probably argue that um, I, I kind of find his motives a little bit hard to pass, but I think I think he's pretty pretty committed like ideologically speaking, to um, to czarism as such, rather than uh, you know just the stability of the state, but sort of he he kind of leans a bit more in the reformer reformer direction, and so he he kind of it almost seems as at times as though he's trying to turn uh, Russia into a kind of um, I don't know United Kingdom, you know, more of like a constitutional monarchy sort of situation. But but anyway, um, his 
his little library that he operates ends up becoming a, uh, a hotbed of revolutionary activity. But uh, using that that in essentially the police and uh, and Zubatov enthusiastically helping them are able to uh, keep track of uh, of some of these revolutionaries and uh, and he's even even later I think able to convert a couple of them over to his way of thinking and this ultimately becomes his um, his go to sort of uh, methodology. One of the things that he really excels at is, is that he just uh, it comes through the historical record that he is just immensely charismatic and uh, whenever they are able to round up a, uh, a number of revolutionaries, Zubatov, even when he's head of the uh, the Moscow Akrona, he comes in personally and has a chat with the people who he thinks are most um, disenfranchised to the revolutionary cause, perhaps, or uh, or have been led astray, or you know, he tries to pick up on on some of the little uh, markers that uh, that he thinks are setting apart certain people as uh, susceptible to being turned, and he has a very good track record of being able to bring people over to his side. That is to say, earlier on, that's just um, you know helping the Okrana, but later on, he kind of has some uh, some more lofty schemes. Mm, cunning. So at this at this time, um, it sounds to me as though the organization itself is attempting to build its institutional knowledge, but it's early enough on that it really comes down to the the particular skills that get developed by. Uh, particular individuals who are uh, capable of sort of seeing the bigger picture and, and developing uh, the techniques. Would that be fair to say that there's no, there was no school at this point in which uh, Okrana agents would be trained, right? Uh, the only, the only sense in, in which you could say that there are varying schools uh, is like I said, between the internal and the, and the external division. Um, because one thing that's very notable about this division is that it was very formalized and, uh, and so only a very select number of uh, men in the, in the hierarchy, very close to the top, would actually be privy to uh, everything that's going on between these two sections. Otherwise, they were kept completely separate from one another and were completely unaware of the uh, uh, membership activities or you know, basically anything, anything to do with what the other side was doing. So the, um, the code breakers, the letter openers... And the um, you know the shadowers and and like all all of these types of guys who were who were very much uh, more operating in you, you might say is more of a traditional police role are completely separated from the men who were you know both agents and uh, handlers of agents that were working inside of these various revolutionary organizations. So they certainly had the compartmentalization going. Yeah, very much so. And it, it was again took to, to uh, try to make sure that nobody could um, so that you know even if there was some revolutionary sympathetic figure inside uh, inside the uh, the Okrana that they wouldn't be able to get the whole picture almost almost no matter how high they got they would have to be the uh, you know the minister of the interior before they knew everything and even then it probably wouldn't be quite everything but they get it down to uh, sort of such a fine art that even when there are figures who are uh, providing information to the Okrana uh, from you know so that say they were attending a meeting and they were they were tasked with uh, bringing back from this revolutionary meeting, uh, you know, a, lo a load of information, uh, quite often the meeting would be monitored by not one, but two members of the, or I should say at least two members of the, um, the external organization, you know, the, like the monitoring arm, uh, to then try to corroborate what was actually, uh, you know, like what actually happened so that even if one of the handlers or, uh, you know, even one of the one of the monitors was compromised, then they would still be able to get three different points, like three different accounts, basically. And oftentimes, these different, like some of these different monitors, wouldn't even know of each other's existence. Right. So they can triangulate it, and at the same time, when the opportunity presents itself, identify you know who who the party is that is uh, providing the the False incongruous account. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, but all of this sort of develops over time, and one of the things that I think um. This might have existed beforehand. It's kind of hard to tell because um, a lot of the accounts that I read are talking more about the Akrana more or at the end of its life rather than at the start. Uh, but I think it comes in with Zubatov because it kind of fits with his profile that um, they also had to be intimately aware of the the various different strands of revolutionary thought. Uh, and so I think this is probably one of the ways in which people like uh, Zubatov are able to exert such sort of intellectual power and, and charismatic power and, uh, and persuasive power because he knows everything that they think, but he doesn't agree with them. 
Um, and that is eventually expected of basically all members of the uh, Akrana, especially the ones that are going to be actually, you know, dealing with uh, dealing with the revolutionaries in any kind of personal way. But even even some of the uh, some of the men who are just um, you know monitoring the activities of various revolutionaries and shadowing shadowing them are expected to know inside and out what the what the ideologies are of the uh, the men who they're dealing with. And so that carries with it the risk that they would be turned simply ideologically speaking by exposure to the uh, the ideas, you know, kind of like w w sometimes, you know, the uh, sensible centrists will joke about how um, people uh, tasked with monitoring social media exchanges and the rest will uh, have such long exposure to the ideas that they themselves will begin to turn. You know, it's a joke. It's a tongue in cheek thing. But uh, I would imagine it's a very real problem. And I would guess that they would have had to have developed early on some sort of techniques for monitoring their staff as well uh, to begin to note whether or not they begin to show genuine sympathies, right? As far as I can tell, especially for the uh, the internal employees of the Okrana, that was never actually an issue. I have not found one account of a uh, of an Okrana agent being being turned. Wow, nice track record then. Well, uh, you know, perhaps you could draw some conclusions. Uh, from that as to uh, you know which ideas have more merit but uh that, you know fabia from me merit <laughs> but yes um uh, okay so build, building on this um like i said zubatov was a very um very charismatic character but in in his role as and, and sort of as he kind of meteorically climbs through the ranks of the okrana he um is essentially a savant at, at whatever he seems to put his mind to, um, you know, to the point that when he is, uh, you know, by the time he's, he's really only been in the uh, the Okrana for, I can't actually remember how, how long it is, but it's it's really not that long before he's, you know, essentially running the show in in Moscow at least, which is which was at the time considered one of the more, um, as you might imagine, it wasn't the capital, but you know, one of one of the more significant um, areas of revolutionary activity. Um, he he he's basically able to completely completely crush their activities. Um, he he rounds up several rings of uh, um, revolutionary cells and is able to just completely destroy them and, and liquidate them. And it'll it'll kind of come back how completely successfully is uh, a, li a little bit later. But um, even when he moves around, there's a, there's essentially a pattern where he goes to Minsk and Odessa at later points. And whenever he whenever he arrives, the the revolutionary apparatus is is just completely crushed. But the way that he does that is actually kind of interesting, um, especially when it comes to Minsk, because in uh, Minsk, no, no, I'll, I'll 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 start in a slightly different place. Essentially, one of his big ideas, because he becomes quite a reforming figure. He he excels at the old school. And he starts to bring in new ideas, but uh, some of them end up going a little bit too far, and it becomes a very uh, contentious. Um, Point essentially amongst uh, some of the uh, some of the general hierarchy of the uh, the Zardom at the time. So he has he has a couple of people who are very um, very on board. Like uh, he has protection from from above to start off with. So uh, as you can see there, he has uh, Trepov is is one of the men who is behind him, uh, and I believe her Grand Duke. Um, what was it? Mikhail Alexandrovich, I believe, who is later assassinated, unfortunately. Um, they are both uh, sort of very much behind him, and so he has a lot of a lot of backing from the top to carry out. Uh, yeah, that's that's the that's the fellow, Sergei Alexandrovich. Um, essentially, his idea is to take the the wind out of the sails of the revolutionaries by setting up uh, what are later called police unions. So he is he is kind of uh, sympathetic to the, or so it would seem anyway, to the um, to the plight of the the workers and thinks some of the their, some of their issues are, are very much genuine. But he thinks that the best way to uh, try to head off this problem is to, you know, this problem of the revolutionaries is to take away all of the legitimate reasons why people would, for example, join the revolutionary unions. Uh, and so he sets up a number of more patriotic unions, which are then going to uh, do, they, they they do a couple of things. So they uh, able to they're they're able to function as a, a normal union in that they uh, you know petition the employers for for various um, it's called um, 
you know, to to uh, essentially Reform, ameliorate certain problems. Of, yeah, yeah, exactly. Of one, of one kind yeah, yeah. or another. To, uh, to do all of the uh, collective bargaining and such. Um, but then on top of that, the, uh, they, they're also able to provide a lot of uh, cultural benefits, which are perhaps otherwise missing from, uh, from the urban environment slightly. So it's worth bearing in mind that, especially, especially at this point, um, the urbanization of Russia is a very new phenomenon. And so even like very much in Zubatov's time, but even even later on, um, you have people who are not even living full time in the city. So sometimes you have people who are um, a peasant for part of the year and an urban worker for the rest of the year to you know essentially try to make sure that they can make enough money to to continue to live. Um, and so you have a, a like a large amount of very much cultural displacement and people who are used to more of a village life and they are displaced into the cities and the cities are just not developed in, in that way to like accommodate what the peasants are expecting essentially so he provides a lot of uh things like um like i said patriot patriotic activities um but like choirs i think uh, sports groups perhaps um there's there's like religious religious groups um and yeah, all, all this kind mentioned, of thing mentioned, so, yeah. they mentioned here uh, there's one they mentioned in here, Feb February uh, 19th, uh, 1902, Zubatov succeeds in orchestrating a loyal demonstration with religious overtones by about 50,000 workers uh, yeah. to honor Alexander II. So this is a, you know, I don't want to um, break your thread here if you're going to be addressing this uh, at greater length uh, elsewhere, but it does seem that this this whole business of creating um opposition organizations con literally controlled opposition organizations seems to be uh, a big angle for them are, are we going to see this throughout sort yes. of consistently well it, it's more of his project and uh, it does get abandoned relatively speaking at a certain point but it, it's extremely relevant to the uh, 1905 revolution uh, because Essentially, one of the one of the men that he was working with early on uh, is a guy named uh, Georgi or Georgi Gapon, uh, who is a priest. But uh, there's all sorts of weird foibles with him. Uh, he he gets a very colourful um, historiography, especially from the uh, Soviets, who at times don't seem to know what to make of him. Um, he he's sort of convinced of his own destiny, uh, and there's there's all sorts of stories about him considering himself, uh, you know, essentially the Russian Napoleon. And he's he's uh he's he's got a very grand vision of himself uh, where he's he's going to either you know achieve greatness by yeah, this is a, a bit of a historical trope and so I'm not I'm not sure what to make of the quote maybe maybe it's a bit maybe it's fabricated apocryphal or whatever but uh, you know he's either going to uh, achieve greatness by thirty or die trying that kind of that kind of idea but he finds himself in the uh, in the clergy but uh, because he's quite a, a brilliant priest from the uh, from from the perspective of the clergy's um, hierarchy, he's he's sort of released to go and uh, act in, a, in somewhat of a more secular way, and so he is uh, out to promote the interests of the uh, you know the the common man, and as well as their sort of spiritual health, but you know also their their sort of secular needs, and so he becomes sort of like a uh, an activist for uh, workers' rights and you know laborers' rights and things to try and improve their improve their condition alongside their their sort of spiritual health. He works under Zubatov in one of these uh, in one of these unions, uh, and originally Zubatov is not not terribly happy with him. Doesn't necessarily entirely trust him, but uh, sometime later, when uh, Zubatov gets removed, Gapon is sort of given the opportunity to take the take the reins because he he is indeed himself quite a uh, a charismatic character. But you know he's been he's been kept in check for the time being by Zubatov. So he, he's not he's not necessarily too relevant immediately, but uh, yeah, he does figure into this this picture of uh, what you were saying, uh, being able to orchestrate or, or um, organize rather a, a procession of fifty thousand uh, workers through Moscow, and this is particularly remarkable because I mean, like I said, he uh, Zubatov is excelling at basically everything at the time, and so not only has he on the one hand crushed the organized revolutionary uh, opposition. In uh, Moscow, but he is providing, you know, he's basically taking away their steam to be able to come back. He's filling in the void with uh, with his own with his own project, 
And so he is able to, I mean, as, as it probably says in there, because it's a, it's, it's a quote that I've come across in a couple of places, uh, he's able to mobilize 50,000 men in favor of the Tsar at a time when no other organization, even the fairly moderate ones, even the fairly liberal opposition could not come anywhere close to that figure. So Moscow is completely locked down during Zubatov's tenure. And there is, from the perspective of the revolutionaries, complete like no in at all into the, uh, the Moscow um, agitator sphere, I suppose. So Moscow is just a complete loyalist safe haven. And so by uh, contrast, perhaps you're going to go to this next. Uh, during the same time period, uh, what was uh, St. Petersburg like? Uh, St. Petersburg, I am not so sure at this time, but the one there's one other place that I have uh, particularly in mind, which is Minsk, because at the time you have, well, and around Lithuania as well. I think Vilnius is quite is quite bad for it as well. But the, the group that had been very much organized around here uh, was the uh, Jewish Labor Bund, although it has, a, it has some other names as well. I, I believe it's all the same organization. Um, essentially, it was a, because there was a fairly large Jewish population in the area, especially in terms of uh, laborers, they organized their own independent union. And they were able to uh, they were considered one of the one of the three major pillars of the uh russian revolutionary or like the uh, the socialist revolutionary movement and they were able to yeah it's the, these guys uh and they were they were able to basically pioneer quite a lot of the uh the methods that were later used by other organizations but they undergo a pretty critical period when uh, like i said um zupatov is actually moved around so when the leadership realizes how, how good of a job uh, Zubatov is doing, they move him around to a couple of other different areas. So uh, there's Odessa first, which to my knowledge, otherwise hadn't necessarily been um, quite as bad, although it has, it has some fairly large um, minority ethnic populations. And so that always sort of tends to uh, cause problems just in terms of um, having more, having a, like a greater base of um, sort of ethnic interests to draw on. That tends to turn, uh, turn the whole sort of revolutionary thing into a little bit more of a visceral project. Um, but the when, when he shows up in Minsk, uh, in Minsk particularly, the Jewish Labour Bund are uh, crippled. Essentially, they uh, he, they're uh, summarily rounded up. Essentially, um, all of the leadership in the area, and he manages to Zubatov personally manages to convince almost all of them. I think that um, essentially their their current track is wrong, and that they are. Uh, that they should instead try to work within Zubatov's framing um, because what he was offering was state support for um, you know, most of their interests. So, so the ones that were actually uh, genuinely in favor of improving a lot of the workers could be better served by working with Zubatov. And that meant abandoning the revolutionary, compo the revolutionary socialism components of everything that they were advocating. And quite a lot of, uh, like enough of them agreed to this, that essentially the, the organization in Minsk was disbanded and it was replaced by another completely different loyalist organization that was able to completely dominate the, uh, uh, the, the sort of trade union and, uh, and socialist sphere, but obviously under, under complete police pur purview. Okay. So up through, or uh, at least up to the beginning of, uh, the stuff with 1905, it seems like Zubatov is, uh, is, um, enjoying considerable success, um, it, would you say that's fair characterization that he really is uh, doing a, a good job of uh, containing all of this? Yes, he is. He is doing a very good job. Um, but there are some ways in which what he is doing is dangerous, and it's sort of recognized by certain figures at the time. So, in particular, people like uh, von Pleven are, or von Plever rather, are not very happy with the direction that he's going in. And so, um, on the accession of von Plever. Uh, I believe it is that uh, Zubatov see starts seeing a bit more um, resistance and pushback to his methods, because von Plever's argument is essentially that uh, you're using government resources to stoke the problem of socialism, but you're doing so in a way that you claim is helping us. Well, you know, fifty thousand people in the street is a dangerous is a dangerous tool, regardless of who's at the head of it, and regardless of what they're chanting, and that is going to be again very prescient in the near future. Because do, do you have any do you have any sense of what it was he would propose as an alternative? 
Um, just cracking, uh, cracking down. I believe he was a little bit more of the, uh, a little bit more of the old school. I think essentially, right. in that he fill, wanted... fill, fill a ditch with with your enemies, and they won't be a problem in the future. Yeah, just basically arrest the um, arrest the ringleaders and the um, uh, what's it called, you know, the, the the people who are causing the most amount of trouble at the time. Um, just get right, rid the of the demagogues and firebrands. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, get rid of the so, leadership. So, Sorry, gone. Uh, well, uh, we'll fin finish your point because I had a second question, but I didn't mean to cut you off there. Okay, yeah, no, sorry. Um, uh, essentially, just you know, cut cut that off. The snake and the rest dies. Uh, as long as you get rid of, as long as you destroy the organization, then the rest, you know, the the, the problems that are being elucidated are, you know, fake. You might say to to l expand a little bit on what what I believe his worldview to to be. Um, you know, there there is no no like pressing need for reforms. That this is not an actual genuine issue. It's just it's created by the revolutionaries. So if you just get rid of the revolutionaries, then uh, you know the, that like there's no problem anymore. <laughs> right. What's what's the problem? Yeah. Uh, so uh, d during this time period, did they have a place to uh, send? I mean, they were presumably using Siberia and using pulling what they could conceive of as surplus population and pushing it in a forced fashion eastward to settle all of their uh, new domains, many of which were in quite inhospitable places, right? This didn't all start with the gulags, right? Under the czars, they could still conceivably, you know, to uh, Pleva's uh, uh, point here, they could round up 50,000 people if they brought the army in and they could put them into train cars after, uh, you know, removing the firebrands among them and they could send them out to settle an area in the Russian Far East, right? So they, they, there were things they could do other than simply kill everyone. The the gulag system, I guess what I'm asking is that that wasn't the, the first point at which authorities in this geographic region um, uh, basically gathered up uh, troublesome populations and did away with them in a, in, a, in a fashion that was productive for them. Right. No, you had to do a lot at, uh, in this time period in order to uh, to be executed. Um, you know, so fairly famously, Lenin's brother is one of the people who who pushes this boundary specifically because he's trying. To, he's involved in an assassination plot against the Tsar. That's that's essentially how uh, how high up you have to get. Uh, otherwise, they're typically um, tied to fairly normal standards of um, just of you know criminal justice. So if you throw if you throw a bomb into a crowd then you're probably going to get executed it, you know it, any any civilian would do that it doesn't really matter whether you're a revolutionary or not um but just for being in possession of things like banned literature which there was you know there, there, were, there were printing presses around who were who were doing this kind of thing um they would typically just be uh given exile and that consisted in uh, that, that came in two different flavors uh they could either go into Siberia, as you said, for a period of up to five years, um, or they could choose to go abroad instead. Uh, in which case, they wouldn't be able to come back. So those were basically their two basically their two options. And do you have uh, any sense of how many people uh, were pushed through that system? For example, to the Far East or Arctic regions, or you know, out into the tundra, and not not to you know uh, put you on the spot to uh, to provide any kind of an exact figure, but let's say you know in uh, across a period. You, well, let's say around the time of the 1905 revolution as they were like cleaning up afterwards and the rest. I mean, how many people got sent off to such places? Are we talking about like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands? Do you have any sense? I believe we're talking tens of thousands, maybe um, something like that. But um, uh, to imagine that this is the same situation that the, uh, the later gulags are. Um, uh, essentially, what happens is that there's a uh, like a cartoonish picture painted. Uh, by two parties, um, the liberals who are opposed to any kind of like secret police as such, and you know believe it's uh, sort of against um, against everyone's sort of political rights to uh, you know to be a political prisoner in any sort of way, and then obviously the the revolutionaries who are the ones that are um, who, who have the most interest in kind of smearing smearing the idea of a secret secret police because they are you know specifically the targets for the secret police that they are the ones doing the terror bombings and the uh, assassinations, so they they obviously want to. Uh, portray the um the regime as as tyrannical and autocratic as possible but in reality um yeah it, it's really not that not that grim at all so the the later 
um, gulag system is essentially what they painted the the, the original uh, czarist system to be. When you know, in reality, if if you even if you just go and read the uh, the accounts of people like um, Stalin and Lenin and their, like their time in exile uh, in the, uh, the Far East, it's it's really not that bad. You know, so Lenin Lenin is placed with his I can't remember his wife or girlfriend at the time um, in a in what is essentially you might call a Mediterranean paradise. You could you could probably almost say so. He has basically free reign. He, he just has to stay within the bounds of the village. Uh, and it's but it's a place in in Siberia that is uh, is famous for uh, lemons, I think lemons or or oranges, you know, to give you some idea of the climate. Right. Okay. So that the 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 reason I was asking really was to get down to the issue between uh, Zubatov and Pleva or wh whatever his name was, simply because I'm I'm trying to figure out, you know, would it would it be feasible to take uh, what's his name. Um, von uh, Pleva's uh, approach and say, let's just send them off to, to uh, in, into exile and execute, you know, a few of them that are the, the worst of the problems. Or was there a lot of sense in what Zubatov was doing? I guess there's no way to know for sure, but it does seem um, that the exile system was simply jamming these people together and allowing them to teach each other and gain a sympathetic ear while they were in exile and convert people and continue their activities. So perhaps uh, von Pleva's idea was, um, I don't know, not as uh, not as feasible. Well, I'm sympathetic to uh, von Pleva's idea, uh, if only because when you when you have these schools kind of like fighting against one another, the catastrophic failure of uh, Zupatov system that the 1905 revolution partly represents is fixed by von Pleva's uh, solution. Fair in the, enough. In that essentially they do just uh, activate all of their agents uh, to just round everyone up and um, you know send them off into 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 exile or if they were uh, you know alternatively involved in something a little bit more serious then uh, executed. But mo mostly they were just um, you know either imprisoned or or sent into exile. Yeah, so there's. Uh, I have anticipated something that you were doubtless already going to cover here. I've, I've uh, been asking all these questions before you were even able properly to get to uh, to 1905. So sorry, sorry. Please go on. No, no, it's uh, it's okay because this this there are there are endless um, endless digressions that can take place because one of the other issues that um, that is, I don't think it falls into this exact uh, sort of uh, schism, but there is a, a persistent problem. Um, that seems to spring up at, at around the same time as um, Zubatov's uh, tenure, but uh, you know might might well predate him. Uh, in that they had a tendency, the Ukraina had a tendency to sort of sit on information and sort of uh, use their very extensive network of of agents and uh, all of their all of their various assets to accumulate basically as much information as possible. Kind of helps in the legal case apart from anything else because just as as another very quick aside. So we were talking about. Um, Exile just now, and that's actually one of the. I think officially that is the only thing that the Okrana can do unilaterally. Essentially, that's the only way. That's the only punishment that they can impose, which uh, does not go through normal legal channels. Other than and that, I'm sorry, what was do. what was that again? Exile is the only thing that the Okrana can do huh. without without you know going through the normal legal channels. Because other than that, they would basically just arrest them, present them to the civil, um, you know, civil courts, and then that, that would you know. Present their evidence, and hopefully, hopefully, it goes in their way. So, probably partly due to that, the um, the Okrana had a tendency to sit on on their on their networks, and they would just sit there gathering information indefinitely, and, and they would allow all these things to happen. They would allow all the agitation to happen. Happen, and uh, you know, some some figures are getting very skeptical of this, very much more in the uh, von Pleva school, um, basically because they're saying, you know. You're waiting. You're waiting all this time to go and arrest them and get like get them off the uh, get them off the streets. But in, in the meantime, they're trying to uh, radicalize the local army garrisons and the police garrisons and everything. So, are you sure that you are actually going to be able to go in and arrest them when the time comes, or are you going to find yourself stranded uh, by you know mutineers who are who are going to try and turn against you? Well, who, who are and, uh, going to turn against you when you when you actually need them? You're, you're just sort of letting all this fester. Right. And you certainly could have the same kind of reaction that we see in our, our, our current day where, you know, people look at the FBI and they're like, you know, you knew about every aspect of this plot and yet it continued, you know, 
So it's yeah. it's not um not difficult to see how certainly people involved with law enforcement would be like, you know, what the hell are you doing? Yes, exactly. Uh, and this this it, this becomes a persistent problem until 1905, when you know all of these all these different networks are activated and uh, and everyone's sort of cracked down on. But this kind of takes us into another direction because, like I said, there was another like I said earlier, there was another sort of schism that was um, I don't know, a, a, like a conflict in uh, in approaches with um, Zubatov taking more of the uh, you could say liberal side of side of this whole this whole equation with people like von Plever being um, a little bit more skeptical uh, in that Zubatov was willing to work with people like uh, Yevno Azef, although I think it might might have predated him the uh, the working with Yevno Azef. Essentially this is a uh, this is a guy who manages to so he, he works with the uh, military the most militaristic wing like the, I think it's called the combat organizations of the uh, or combat groups of the SRs, so he's like the most, uh, like the head of the most violent part of the most violent revolutionary faction, uh, and so he is the, the, essentially the head of a lot of these uh, terroristic activities. Um, but he is in cooperation with the Okrana, and he's passing information to the Okrana, and theoretically he's working for them. But then it gets a little bit awkward when he uh, is still in charge when von Plever is actually assassinated and if you uh, if you were reading anything about about what happened to uh, von Plever yeah he is he's actually assassinated by the uh, the combat organization and it's ostensibly being run at the time by an Okrana agent so what's going on there well officially it comes down to this um the schism like it, that I was mentioning earlier where the where people like Azef were operating mostly uh, independently, but they were passing some crumbs of information in exchange for you know payouts and whatever from the Okrana and trying to keep the Okrana off his back whilst he whilst he you know pursues his own ends. I have a suspicion that there may be some potentially other things at play. Maybe it's just a, a little bit of you know maybe it's just a schizo tendency uh, or <laughs> something like that. But um, you know I, I kind of wonder if there are networks within networks at play. That are basically, um, you know, working with people like Yevno Asef to uh, remove internal rivals. So, you know, I can't help but can't help but note that um, the Zubatov school of, um, you know, doing Okrana policing is uh, is benefited immensely by the death of uh, von Plever. But by the same token, uh, Asef is himself a Jew, and von Plever is considered, especially in the uh, the Jewish media. Of the time, so you know, for example, the Jewish Labour Bund have their own um, uh, newspaper that was that is very widely circulated. So that's kind of what I'm referring to there. Not, not nothing else. No other implications there. Just to be clear, um, they are very accusatory towards von Plever of uh, being, you know, essentially allowing pogroms to take place in 1903. I think it is, uh, and so von Plever is considered, you know, somebody who's like an, an enemy of the Jews. And so, um, you know, another argument is that Azef is Kind of going a little bit rogue just for the sake of uh, killing killing an anti semite, um, you know, and, and, and an anti semite of some power. It must be said. But the but you know essentially what it comes down to is somebody who is on the uh, the czarist payroll is killing members of government. So you have to wonder, okay, what is going on here, and how much did uh, how much did everyone know? Because it, part of the problem of the historiography of all of this, uh, as with the sacred guard that I mentioned earlier, is that. Uh, some good portion of it has been lost. Um, we don't necessarily know all the details, and what we do know is coloured very much by the, uh, well, what the Bolsheviks thought essentially, and what the what the Bolsheviks wanted you to think about certain uh, pieces of the uh, pieces of the imperial history. So we get a very skewed picture of what the Okrana was like and what they actually did. And I have a, a quick question for you. You know, I did a a, a thing where. Um... I went back and I tried to, to get a sense of uh, how Jewish the revolutionary movements in Russia were, particularly among socialists, you know, early communists, uh, these kind of groups, right? And um, I went through and put together this thread. Let me see if I could just show it here. I, you know, I certainly don't know as much about any of this uh, as you do. Um, 
but I went through and tried to put this together some time back. This is three or four years ago, right? And um, I was looking at communism in Russia and how the claim is always that, you know, the Bolsheviks or had huge overrepresentation of Jews among them and this kind of thing. And I found a bunch of these figures, you know, just by looking through um, the, you know, the record. And there are all kinds of uh, revolutionaries um, who weren't Jewish, but the, the majority of them are early, right? Yeah. Um, so it's Russian socialism, it's utopianism, right? And there's just many of them who just weren't Jewish. It's, it's very, very clear. However, um, it, when they do start to appear um, is right around with uh, this woman, this uh, uh, she she's a uh, um, uh, Hesia Helfman. She's one of the ones who uh, was with them when they threw the bomb under the czar's carriage. You know Alexander the second, and she yep. was the first one I could find. And it's relatively late, so as best I can tell, and and please do correct me if I'm wrong, because this was just a uh, you know shooting from the hip, quick research, right? Um, as best I could tell, the early activities of revolutionaries in Russia didn't have uh, 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 any kind of Jewish overrepresentation in them that I could see until after uh, the business with uh, Alexander II. And from and, and you know we were just looking through this. It was uh, interesting that you know August 1903, you've got uh, von Pleva meeting with uh, Theodore Herzl. Um, it's just it seems to be a relatively late thing. And if you've got people like um, Zubatov meeting with uh, the Bund in Minsk, you know, I wonder whether or not in some respects, the heavy Jewish revolutionary involvement was something that was almost fostered by people like Zubatov later on. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just uh, spitballing here um, and throwing some ideas out there just to see what your thoughts on this are, having looked into it, uh, you know, at length, whereas I have not. Going by the, um, uh, essentially the words of, uh, a, you know, a guy who was dealing with this, uh, that is to say, uh, Vasiliev. Um, he basically just treats it as uh, like an open and shut case that, yes, the, the, the Jews are vastly overrepresented in these revolutionary groups. But there's a, another layer where perhaps they're not, they're not always necessarily in leadership positions at every stage. Um, but anytime there's a movement against or, or like some kind of disturbance, the Jews are essentially at the core of it um, in, in some way. So I've heard it argued, for example, that this is what ends up causing some of the pogroms, if you, if you want to frame the whole uh, issue in that way, in that especially in... Uh, areas of the Pale and places like Odessa. Um, there are some major riots against the, uh, the Tsarist government and the Jews are, are very transparently at the center of that. Uh, they are the right. people so who it's, are in the streets. Right, so it's a, it's, a, it's a spin basically on the old, you know, then suddenly for no reason at all. Um, yes. Okay. It, I but, do. I do want to clarify for people who are in the chat, you know, acting as though I'm trying to erase or minimize something. I'm not. I simply pointed out that you don't see them, uh, or I at least, with my superficial review, did not see them becoming an active part of the series problems uh, and appearing in any numbers until uh, after about 1880. Um, so you know, I'm I'm not disputing anything about the 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 overrepresentation of Jews among you know Bolshevik leadership or any of that at all. I'm just trying to get a sense of where uh, they come uh, come into the picture. And do you do you happen to to know anything about that in terms uh, you know when you just mentioned that they are often involved where all the trouble starts? Can you put a a time frame on that when they really begin to appear on the scene as an issue? I can't necessarily put an exact time frame on that. Um, it seems to be something that just uh, permeate, permeates the entire Akrana period, and I'm not necessarily too off fait with the uh, revolutionary goings on outside of that. Right. Prior, so really, the the picture is yeah, Jews are certainly involved heavily from at least the time when Alexander II was assassinated. Yes, at the at the very least. Okay. Um, but I mean, it, it's so on on the on this issue. 
uh, everybody who is privy to the like the information that is being gathered by the Okrana, and I should say that it, it is collated for uh, you know into basically reports. They have their own internal newspaper, which goes out to um, the heads of the various Okrana branches, and I th and also directly to the Tsar. So the Tsar is keeping very much on top of all of this, uh, uh, you know, all of the goings on with all the various revolutionary activities and all the, all the news bulletins on what's got, what the, the Okrana is doing and what they've cracked down on. And he, you know, maybe you could just say he's an, he, he was an anti-Semite beforehand and he continues to be an anti-Semite, but he, he does treat it just very much as an open, like a, not even a question. It, it is not a question that the, uh, that the Jews are basically at the center of this whole revolutionary thing, especially when you get to the later periods, you know, in the 20th century. Um, it, they just are. It, it's a matter of what you do with that information. And he, he right. generally falls on the side of, you know, we need to stay within the law, but I mean, yeah, all the revolutionaries are Jews, but don't, that doesn't mean you should pogrom them. Right, right. Okay. It's also interesting, though, that um, Jews seem to also be quite well represented in the, uh, uh, in the ranks of, <laughs> and this is actually uh, remarked on, that um, essentially the Jews are also very, very much more willing to work with the government. And that kind of comes through, uh, as I mentioned, with the uh, the Jewish Bund in Minsk, where Zub uh, Zubatov was able to actually flip basically the entire uh, leadership of the uh, the local chapter of the Bund to act as basically his personal organization that took orders directly from him, or at least di directly from his position. Because later, after he after he's displaced and uh, replaced by somebody who is a little bit less um, sympathetic towards his methods, uh, they are ordered to disband and they do so that that's the end of his organization basically overnight a few of them commit suicide i believe but you know essentially the point being that uh you know the uh, jews are also it seems kind of disproportionately um represented amongst the people who will quite happily help the police as well take what you will from that the um uh the writer suggests that uh, it's because they are very money centric but uh you know perhaps there's there's other reasons for that because obviously if, if you look at the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, then the Jews are there uh, disproportionately rep um, represented among the number of Habsburg loyalists. So I don't know, there's, there's probably just more more going on there. Right. Okay. I just do uh, uh, just a moment, uh, uh, Rupert, sir. I just want to clarify for people in the chat, you know, they're talking about, you know, naming uh, groups and the rest. There's none of that going on here. What's going on here is a review of historical material and the uh, justifications, explanations, and speculations made by historical figures in the historical record that we're considering now. So, yeah, cool your jets. Sorry, Rupert, go on. Sir. Yeah, I mean, one of the most uh, one of the most committed Okrana agents I've uh, I've come across, whose name eludes me. It's a uh, it's a woman. Uh, I can't seem to can't seem to find her name. Um, Essentially, she was such a committed uh, Zarist loyalist that uh, she, I'm not even sure that she actually took any money for her for her efforts. She did uh, some of the most dangerous jobs, even continuing to be a, uh, you know, essentially a secret agent uh, on behalf, like within, embedded within revolutionary organizations after being discovered uh, as, you know, as an agent. Um, and she went on to marry a Jew. So, yeah. So, um, moving on from that, like I said, just going back to the part where Zubatov gets ousted, he he disappears, I think, in 1903, and he gets replaced by uh, a man who tries to dismantle quite a lot of his uh, like what he's what he's built up, especially in terms of the police unions, because it's considered a a, a danger and a liability. Uh, I don't remember exactly who that uh, who his replacement is, but. Um, yeah, essentially, these these networks are ordered to be dismantled, but not all of them will go into that uh, into that night quite so gently. And people like Gapon take this as an opportunity to step onto the scene. So he has uh, quite a lot of influence already built up in uh, in one of these organizations in particular. I forget which one it is. You might be able to find it in the uh, Wikipedia article there somewhere. Which organization he was actually affiliated with, um, but essentially he he kind of takes on his own. Um, his own motives, and um, starts working essentially towards what the sell was for what for what the uh, for what Zubatov was yeah you know, for what Zubatov was selling basically. Um, he um, 
essentially renounces the Tsar, especially leading into Bloody Sunday. Um, yeah, that's the that's the name, the Assembly of Russian Factory and Mill Workers of St. Petersburg. So there you go. Uh, and it also gives you uh, the name of Akashi Mojotiro there, who is also going to be very relevant. But uh, yeah, so he, he goes into uh, Bloody Sun. So yeah, Gapon goes into Bloody Sunday with um, essentially the intention to try to make his demands felt regardless of whether or not the Tsar is on board with it. And so he's kind of uh, moving away from this purely loyalist motivation that the group had originally been uh, sort of founded with. And, um, you know, I guess you could take some, you could take something about the psychology of crowds from all this, that the crowd, which had formerly been very, very loyalist, uh, are kind of willing to to go alongside him, even though the, uh, we're talking probably about pretty much the same men who had previously been chanting uh, God Save the Tsar through the streets of um, Moscow. In any case, um, regardless of all of the, uh, so there was a, a number of roadblocks that were set up. Everybody kind of knew that this was going to happen. Um, they knew that he was coming. Uh, they tried to stop him. They tried to warn him that force would be used. There were even gunshots that were fired at some of these various military checkpoints to try and stop him from proceeding through with the crowd. Um, and they ignore it. Uh, Gapon is basically well aware ahead of time that there's going to be blood. And uh, yeah, he just sort of carries through until... Uh, try to clarify what he's actually trying to do here, he has a, a fairly large uh, petition it, there's a little bit of contention as to how many signatures that there are actually on this petition. I think uh, Gapon himself claim, claims hundreds of thousands or something. But um, yeah, uh, he he leads them into gunfire, and they they like some some portion of them go through with it. Uh, Gapon himself is saved from being shot, though basically everybody around him, uh, you know, including a couple of uh, bodyguards that that he had with him, are themselves shot and killed. Subsequently, that to that he sort of goes into exile. Uh, in a, well, in a manner of speaking, anyway, he he, he escapes, and um, with the help of Akashi Mojotiro, he organizes a like a, a, a kind of conference, basically a, a socialist conference, to gather together all of the different socialist groups, um, some of which are in exile, some of which are operating within the uh, you know within the borders of Russia actively, and uh, that is all funded by Mojotiro, who is kind of concurrently to all of this, he has been set loose in Russia slightly prior to the war, I believe. Um, but essentially, especially by that point, his job, after being given an, a pretty monumental amount of money by the Japanese government, is to foment all kinds of uh, chaos on the home front, basically as much as he can. So he is paying everybody from Finnish nationalists and separatists to uh, Polish revolutionaries, socialist revolutionaries, and basically anybody he, who he can meet who is a discontent and you know, the, the more violent, the better. So he pays to, to bring all these people together and uh, organize what is what becomes the 1905 revolution when they when all of these different groups activate simultaneously after at like essentially after this conference I believe it is mainly. Um, but... And this is very this is very interesting to me because uh, you know I just recently did a clip on uh, Prometheanism and uh, Piłsudski, you know the 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 Polish nobleman and military fellow who uh, was central to developing that. Uh, strategic approach to dealing Funny with enough. Russia. I think uh, yes. I think Pilsudski is a terrorist at this time. He's one of the people who's taking part in this kind of things. In this kind of thing, as, yes, uh, as... and apparently went out yeah. and uh, visited Japan in order to uh, present his ideas to them. Where he receives, if I'm remembering all this correctly, um, but at some point he's certainly dealing with the Japanese. I can't remember if it's there in person, but he's he's setting up. He's 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 basically pitching the idea of Prometheanism. For those who don't know, it's a strategy of separating all the constituent groups of the Russian empire that are not Russians and peeling them off. So they're no longer um, a source of strength for the Russians and then winding them up, turning them against the Russians, sending them back to fight with them. So moving them firmly over into the cat, uh, column of being a liability for the Russians. And apparently this uh, Moto Jiro uh, fellow, um, and others in Japan uh, thought this was a great idea and um, found it quite interesting because, of course, this is when the um, the Russo-Japanese War is going on, right? Uh, all of this is basically coming to a head around the same time. Yes, yeah, but um, I mean, I, I 
so most people tie the 1905 revolution specifically to the Russo-Japanese War, but I'm you know trying to make a point of, of barely even mentioning it because I think that you can. I, I think a lot of this stuff is basically in play, when, even when you separate the uh, the the ongoing war. Uh, right. It, so it, it could just be a it could just be a contributing factor, right? It's just another source of money for the revolutionaries who would want to do this anyway. Is what I'm hearing from you. Yes, well, um, one, y yes, that is definitely true. Um, but also, I think it, it gets you away from talking about, um, you know, things like public sentiment about around the conduct of the war and, and things like that. So I think it's quite quite a useful lens from from that perspective. So you can just look straight to the people who are who are actually doing the stuff that gets gets Russia from uh, you know where they were to where they go. Right. Um, so I, I actually just on on that quick uh, Prometheus uh, or Promethean strategy digression, I do wonder if uh, Japan took some influence from this or whether it was just something that was developed concurrently because they obviously also also have the uh, uh, what is it called the is it the Black Dragon or the Black Lotus Society ongoing um, where they're trying to foment a lot of this same kind of thing. Uh, Japan, I, sh I should say, Imperial Japan, and they end up actually um, supporting basically any group that is going to be uh, anti. Uh, anti-Western, generally speaking, but you know, anti their enemies more specifically. So uh, they they tried to ferment uh, things like Asian solidarity and and kind of like a, an early form of um, third worldism in order to uh, you know try to you know over overthrow the white man in um, in Asia. Essentially, they even um, have a big thing going on in Ethiopia, I believe, where they are supporting. Uh, a kind of black supremacism, I guess, uh, basically, um, you know, this is during the, um, Italo, the second Italo Ethiopian war. And so, you know, you kind of have all these parties, it, it kind of goes alongside the, the initial is it 19th, it might've been in 1933 or 1934 or something like that, where, uh, Germany first tries to invade or first tries to Anschluss Austria and Italy steps in and, uh, and essentially pre presents an ultimatum that they would go to war if that happens. So you have all three of these powers all working directly against one another just a few years before they're all uh, ostensibly allies with one another. Very interesting. But, yes, um, and Pisutsky apparently was pushing for uh, this to happen in Central Asia as well, you know, in places yeah. like uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, and today, as I mentioned in that recent stream, just a, a quick tidbit, you know, we again see Poland making alliances with countries in the Far East, in this case, military uh, and industrial um, agreements, in any case, with uh, South Korea for uh, military equipment production and the purchase of large numbers of South Korean tanks by the Poles um, that they just agreed to recently. And it's yes. very likely going to be extended to uh, military production in Poland with the support of the uh, the South Koreans bringing in their technical expertise. So to me, at least, it seems impossible not to see echoes of Poland reaching out towards these countries further east and attempting to basically bookend uh, Russia in that fashion. To be fair, though, I wouldn't necessarily draw a line of continuity between these two points because the the vision of Pilsudski's enemies for what Poland would constitute is is what, the one that essentially won out. So Pilsudski wanted wanted like a greater Poland, almost like a restoration of the uh, the Commonwealth. And I believe that's I believe they called it the Second Polish Republic specifically for that reason because they were they were calling back to the um, the Commonwealth and trying to essentially resurrect that under under Pilsudski. Right, which would be which would be less nationalist, right? Because it was more yeah. imperial. Yeah, the the opposition to that idea was was like a purely Polish, like closer to a Polish ethno state, essentially. Even though they ended up getting sort of the, well, uh, the worst of both worlds in, in a certain sense when they had to uh, take on all of these all these extra different areas that were inhabited by non Poles for purely circumstantial reasons, more or less. Right. But um, yeah, I, I kind of I, I suppose I lend uh, Poland a little bit of credence in this regard because uh, kind of what else are they going to do? I don't think the the Polish heartland really necessarily has enough um, natural strength to overcome Russia unless, but yeah, unless Russia is either extremely weak, which is, uh, well, maybe they could try and enforce that scenario, but uh, it's not necessarily the case at the moment to the, to the sufficient degree, or alternatively, you know, Poland tries to band together with whoever they possibly can on the peripheries of Russia to make alliances of convenience. Right, right. And we see that, of course, today. But I, I did not mean to, to, to drag you off uh, in this direction. But it does it does bear in some sense upon this historical period we're looking at, certainly. Yeah.
Well, it's, it's the same kind of thing happening in reverse in a certain sense with um, Mojo Tiro because he is, like I said, just throwing money at basically anybody who will um, who will be willing to raise arms against uh, against Russia and uh, and cause trouble on the home front. So, like I said, he comes in and uh, bankrolls all these different organizations to spring into action and cause the the Russian army to be needed at home, and it uh, you know potentially expedites the process of uh, settling a peace treaty, which otherwise could have been much more dis much more unfavorable to the Japanese. If we're going to go into the Russo-Japanese war, there was a, a lot of you know obviously we remember it as a bit of a uh, humiliation of Russia, but um, you know especially at the time of the peace treaty in I think it was 1906. Uh, Japan was hurting a hell of a lot more than Russia was. Russia was, um, in theory, ready to go in for um, round two, and Japan was just basically holding on. Um, their finances had been completely ruined. The war was becoming quite unpopular on the home front when the casualties were mounting up. And uh, Japan, although winning a lot of engagements, was faring very badly in um, in terms of like the casualties and uh, and you know like the, the damage that their army was taking in order to sort of win the victories that they were winning. So. You know, on the on the counter, uh, the counter side, Russia is kind of operating very far from its heartland, and at the at the very end of its um, logistical possibilities. I don't think at this point the um, Trans Siberian Railroad had even been completed, so they would get as far as uh, I want to say Irkutsk or something, maybe Cheetah, and then um, and then they'd have to do the rest on foot <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Right, right, muddy wagons. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which uh, you know, far from ideal. But uh, yeah, be that as it may, um, Japan was trying to field the same army, and uh, Russia had, was raising a brand new army. But they ended up using that to quell the 1905 revolution instead. Originally, a load of um, concessions are made in the form of uh, you know various manifestos and declarations. Um, people who had been hardcore loyalists were essentially pushed out and people who are who were considered a little bit more on the reforming side were brought in to try and sort of stabilize things. Um, so think people like, uh, I think this is when Pobodonostev goes out and Vita comes in. And Vita is kind of more of a, in a lot of ways, he's a pretty good um, loyalist. He, uh, I, I don't think he ever really betrays the Tsar per se, but... Um, he is kind of working in a more, in a bit more of a liberal direction. And then uh, after that, you get people like uh, Stolypin coming in, who are a lot more on the hardline side, but trying to work, uh, I guess, within the within the possibilities available to them, not diminishing the power of the Tsar while simultaneously trying to modernize uh, Russia as best as possible. Um, I don't. I think it'd probably be going a little bit off topic to get too much into things like the agrarian reforms that Stolypin was, put, was pushing, pushing through. But suffice to say, on the enforcement side, he was a lot more on the, uh, you know, let's say, the, the von Plever school of uh, just crack down and uh, destroy any uh, signs of revolutionary activity that you can find. And do I have this guy right? We're talking about uh, Piotr Stolypin. Yes, indeed, him. Um, very righteous man. He uh, he ends up later being assassinated, funnily enough, again by a uh, an Okrana agent. The uh, the official narrative seems to go that um, the Okrana agent that killed him was um, a former Okrana agent at the time, or alternatively, because it's not necessarily an open and shut case, nobody I think possibly even now people don't really necessarily know the full details of what happened. Uh, there's another theory that um, it was sprung on the uh, the agent last minute. And so without erasing suspicion, he couldn't, he basically couldn't say no. Um, you know, he could come up with all sorts of theories as to why Stolpin died, but he uh, he spends his final breaths um, praying for the Tsar. Yeah, that fellow. Also Jewish, incidentally, I believe. Um, going back a bit then. Um, so where were we? Um, Everything was everything was rolled back on uh, Zubatov's reforms, especially after 1905. Uh, his his program was considered a pretty catastrophic failure, and the von Plever school uh, won out. In you, you might say, in that uh, they were essentially ordered to activate um, all of their all of their networks, arrest everybody who they uh, who they had tabs on, and in that way, the worst of the revolutionary activity was was basically curtailed because they were able to you know perform a, a kind of decapitation strike uh, on many of the uh, most prominent revolutionary groups. 
And it seems like somehow uh, in the interim here, it appears in 1904, uh, uh, Bonpleva was, uh, was assassinated himself. Yeah. Uh, so when I say the Von Plever school, I mean, you know, just because, because we've, just right, because right, we've established right. that as the, the sort of line of thinking. Right. Um, so uh, a quick question um, that do you have any sense and perhaps you're going to touch on this uh, and we're planning to do so already, but I can't help but be curious. What, do you feel how do I say this? It seems as though following from what you said thus far, it seems as though uh, up until the 1905 revolution, uh, uh, Zubatov's approach seemed to be working. Right. Um, it seems and to be then, very well. Yeah. And then uh, von Pleva comes in and uh, and says, "No, we've got to do it a different way." He gets killed, but his people uh, roll up the existing networks as best they can, activate it, seize them, no longer just quietly monitor, right? But I have to wonder at that point, did their showing their hand in that way make it so that it became much harder to track and infiltrate these revolutionary organizations? I mean, because it, you roll everybody up all at one time, that would have to create sort of an institutional knowledge, a collective memory among the revolutionaries that, you know, this is for real. We're all under surveillance. We've got to have better cell structures. You know, it's one thing to to have the state monitoring you meticulously uh, when they're not taking action because, you know, the web doesn't tremble so to speak sending a signal right that that it's been compromised but when you seize everyone all at once it, it would seem to me that that would very likely create a whole new set of practices you know like building antibodies against it do you have any sense of what happened there um yes uh, and that does seem to happen but um i mean it's, it's much like what you said um earlier in that you have a, a handful of extremely gifted individuals who are able to make sure that the okrana uh, maintains a very competent character. Uh, and so in this case, I, I'm afraid I cannot remember the name of him, but there's a particular uh, cryptographer who is, you might say, beyond gifted. He is able to basically just take a look at any any um, any cipher, and it seems like in a couple of days at most, he is able to to decipher, to decipher yeah, to pick it apart and, uh, and translate the message. Um, because by that point, there was all sorts of things, all, all sorts of ways that the... Um, uh, the external organization had had been, um, you know, the revolutionaries knew what they were doing, um, knew what the external organization were doing. They often knew that their letters were being read, and so what they would what they would do is they would couch some of their, um, you know, revolutionary communiques in um, completely, in, in Minecraft. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In uh, in innocuous letters, and then perhaps perhaps there would be some kind of like uh, code that was being used. Or perhaps they would be using uh, invisible ink uh, between the, you know, in the margins and things to to write out a, you know, two two simultaneous letters, one of which was visible, one was not immediately. Um, but in um, in both cases, um, they the Okrana were very quickly able to sort of get around these problems. Uh, so, you know, for example, they they could um, reseal a letter to the extent that it was uh, impossible to know that the that the letter had been opened. Um, they developed techniques for doing that. They uh, developed techniques for being able to read invisible ink without contaminating the paper, which was a problem before then, because prior to developing some of those techniques, they had to immerse it in, you know, a liquid that would that would, you know, make it very very. It would destroy the letter. Basically, you wouldn't be able to then send it on as though nothing had happened. Um, but they got around that problem, and like I said, they got around the issue of the various ciphers that were being used. And so they were so far ahead of the revolutionaries that um, some of those departments were the few. Um, organs of the Okrana that were actually kept on by the later uh, successors under the uh, you know the revolutionaries. So, like the Cheka, for example, take on some of these personnel directly who had been working on the cryptography and uh, and employ them in uh, in service of the Bolsheviks. Right. Like so, after uh, same sort of thing where uh, you know allied um, organizations uh, uh, pick up the best of the old German security. Um, operators and put them to work, right? Um, yes, so but it's, it's even more surprising. It's it's even more surprising in this case, I would say, because uh, you know in the the Okrana, like I said, were very good about recruiting for uh, ideological loyalty, um, e even in full knowledge of what the oppositional ideologies were actually saying. So you know, I know they, they knew what the enemy was thinking, and they were still uh, you know able to um, maintain uh, loyalty. So 
there's put it this way with good reason they were all uh, hunted down basically as soon as possible and, uh, and and removed very very few of the okrana seemed to sort of make it out, out of the other side unless they got out of got out of the country quite early or happened to be out of the country at the time right so these people were very much the exceptions the ones that uh continued to operate within the Cheka organization yeah. okay um and so uh one other uh, just very quick question i feel like we can't leave it out right because the the security forces the okrana and whichever version of it, you know, whichever incarnation of it we're considering, they're dealing with an internet, with international um, revolutionary networks by their nature. I mean, some of them are called the international, you know? Yes. Um, and so, you know, it seems a bit uh, um, a Procrustean, a bit artificial to uh, just cut out this one section and consider the way in which the revolutionaries with whom the Okrana dealt uh adapted their behavior to deal with the techniques that were going on with the Okrana um, when uh, it's it seems impossible to imagine otherwise than that they were dealing with security forces all over the place in the Austri Austrian Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, in, in France, presumably, I mean, in, uh, in Germany. So just very quickly, I know you have a ton of ground to cover and I keep uh, cutting you off, but um, can you say anything just briefly about what sort of other police secret police services you know you don't have to go into any of them but could could you say you know for example safely that pretty much the austro-hungarians had something similar the french had something similar the germans had something similar and that they were all sort of moving ahead at the same rate or could you say that any of these the uh, secret police or internal security organizations were ahead um you know what is what does all that look like i could fairly confidently say that the okrana are probably world leaders uh, in what they do when uh, you know especially by the especially the, at the end of their tenure they are um, the best in probably most of the areas that they are you know commit, committing their energies to insofar as dealing with international threats um, the Okrana had uh, international offices as well so especially in their in allied countries so most notably France due to the you know the the Entente um, they had an office in Paris, a, a particularly major office in Paris, where they were monitoring the activities of, uh, of various agents there. And so, you know, revolutionaries there, I should say. And so they were very, uh, very on top of what was going on abroad. And uh, to a great extent, they were uh, sometimes even more aware of what was going on abroad than, than at home. Um, and funny, funny, you should sort of bring bring that up. Um, it's a bit, bit remiss of me to actually mention it, but uh, to, to have not mentioned it until now. But uh, funny enough, that's that's part of the reason why we actually know so much about the well, well no, no, at least what we do about the Akrana now is because obviously when the revolution happened, um, they would burn all the documents that were held domestically and uh, you know use them for their own purposes where relevant. But in Paris, they didn't have the same ability, and so all of those documents that were held in all the offices were. Uh, kept safe, and we still have them today. I believe they're held by the Hoover Institute or something, or someone like that. Right on. Okay, so they were, uh, it, it seems safe to assume that they were either uh, among the top organizations at this time or were themselves probably the uh, top organization for this at the time. I would say so, yeah. Um, the, only, the only comparable um, example that I've come across uh, for anywhere near the same same level of sophistication, sophistication, and that's only in one very specific area, would just be, um, again, going back to uh, Japan and uh, Mojitiro, because, yeah, I mean, they, they, they had a very sophisticated thing going on with, um, with the way that they were able to use, uh, you know, a substantial amount of money, but not compared to actually fielding an army and, and use it to, to great effect uh, in, in um, countries abroad where they where they deployed it because they they use that and it contributes quite significantly to their later uh, very monumental success in the uh in the second world war so if you've ever wondered why japan was able to enjoy such um you know overwhelming superiority at certain times um and uh, you know able to strike so so proficiently so quickly and and you know do so well basically in the early days a big part of that is because on the on the back end they had a very sophisticated um intelligence network that was uh, that was able to manipulate certain things behind the scenes and gather information and uh and you know push certain pressure points and, and all that kind of thing not all of it you know in a very contemporary style you could say not all of it was uh, officially sanctioned some of it was uh, crossing the private public domain you might say right on 
Very interesting. Yeah, I, I need to stick a bookmark in my mind because I've still not looked at the uh, Japanese in this respect. So yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, okay, so where are we other than that? Uh, winding back to Russia. Um, so we were talking, uh, do you remember where we were? Or, or is there any, any particular place that you'd like me to pick up? Uh, yeah, I believe we had, uh, we were basically, we had wrapped up, um, insofar as I followed you, uh, we had wrapped up the business with the 1905 revolution. Um, the, the Okrana had undergone um, a series of uh, changes, uh, taking a different approach. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, I, I think we're basically uh, past that. You threw in the bit about Japan and the Rus uh, Russo-Japanese war, but uh, I, I suppose it, the, the prospect now opens up of, uh, you know, World War One and the, the revolutionary activity subsequent to that and, you know, the fall of the czar and the rest. Yes. I'm just guessing, you know. Yeah. So, uh, in all honesty, um, I assume you've read through the thread. I have a bit less to to talk about uh, in this regard because um, some of the some of the information that I have access to, um, you know, that might that might change as I do more research. But um, I, I just seem to find that there's a, a little bit less floating around. What I can say for relative certainty is that the Bolsheviks are very significantly, you know, so this is when the, the Bolsheviks start to enter on the scene a little bit more. They had been going for a little while beforehand. I can't remember when they first come into existence, but uh, people like Mojitiro had been in, in contact with Lenin. Um, but I think the Okrana had kind of, um, you know, the, Lenin was on their radar a little bit uh, before. Yeah, so 1903, yeah, that, that fits very well. <clears throat> Uh, the Bolsheviks are particularly interesting uh, because they are directly supported by the Okrana. Um, maybe I've not been necessarily giving um, due weight to the extent uh, to which a lot of these uh, groups are infiltrated by um, you know, Okrana agents, but even in some cases after 1905, when they've really you know, activated to uh, crack down on a lot of, on a lot of these uh, major groups, they've still got a lot of people in very high places. So there's... Um, there's a particularly interesting anecdote around uh, probably one of the most famous men uh, involved in the uh, the old Bolsheviks, especially called uh, Roman Malinovsky. Basically, throughout his entire tenure in the Bolsheviks, he uh, is actually working for the Okrana pretty much the whole time. That's the fellow. Um, so. There's there's all sorts of uh, hilarious things around uh, Roman Malinovsky because in, he's in, never let anyone tell you that Lenin is a good judge of character because Lenin is always behind Malinovsky 100%. Um, you know maybe uh, I don't know maybe there's all sorts of things that you could draw from that but um, just to just just as, as a preface before we get too much further into the Bolsheviks and just keep keep this in the back of your mind um, Zubatov is supposed to have kept his own uh, library of all of the different people who the uh, Okrana had worked with, and that disappears. It you know it might have been burnt at a certain point, or it might it might fall into the wrong hands and just sort of you know disappeared into the ether for uh, for whatever internal political purposes it it, uh, it would become useful. But um, there's some speculation that according to that library, anywhere up to ninety percent of the Bolsheviks, uh, especially the old Bolsheviks, were actually involved with the Okrana in some way. At one point, uh, there are, I think it was, I want to say it was three uh, members of the Duma representing the um, the Bolsheviks, and two of them were Okrana agents. There's a conflict between Roman Malinovsky and uh, I believe it is Stalin over the over who is going to be heading up the you know the main Bolshevik newspaper Pravda, and. Uh, Roman Malinov Malinovsky wins out in that case. So the Okrana basically get to handpick who is going to be the uh, editor of Pravda. All of this basically comes together to, I mean, God, there's, there's even more than that actually as well. Uh, so at, at some points there are actually copies of Pravda that are being printed by the Okrana presses. Uh, it's coming directly out of Okrana uh, offices. So they are directly funding and distributing Bolshevik literature. Why, you may ask. Um, especially knowing what we know that knowing what we know, what is it? knowing what we know now about the Bolsheviks. Well, as it happens, Lenin was tagged very early on as probably the least um, amenable of any revolutionary personalities. He would make enemies wherever he went, 
And this was considered to be extremely useful uh, by the Okrana because he was especially good at uh, picking fights over trivial matters that basically meant nothing. Um, you know, you could, you could maybe say in the grand scheme of things anyway. Um, he would just fight absolutely anybody over absolutely anything. And so he would constantly create schisms in what were formerly fa fairly cohesive movements. And so if you think that, you know, the uh, Russian left was in a fairly cohesive spot before, um, you know, 1905 to the extent that they're all sort of, you know, they're all, they're all meeting on, on comparably good terms and they're all able to work together. By the time you roll around to 1917, especially, um, you have people like Lenin who have gained a lot more prominence. He was, he was still on the stage then, but even then he was, he was still refusing to, uh, to play nice with all the revolutionaries just because of some minor, um, there was some minor issue that stopped him from attending this conference that I mentioned earlier in 1905, the one funded by Mojitiro. He, fun he funded two, but, uh, you know, the one, the one that we mentioned, I can't remember where it was. It might've been in Geneva, I think. In any case, um, yeah, Lenin didn't attend that because, uh, you know, he was throwing a tantrum over something, over some minor thing. Um, so, yeah, essentially, especially in the case of this uh, Pravda editor, uh, what that ends up being a tool for is to further split up the, uh, the revolutionary left. And so the Bolsheviks become the perfect tool for creating conflicts where there hadn't been any before. I mean, the, the revolutionary left were always good at this, but the Menshevik-Bolshevik split I've heard put down to Okrana influence because some of the most outspoken anti-Mensheviks are people who later turned out to be Okrana agents. And funnily enough, a lot of a lot of the um, the people who are denouncing the Okrana agents, uh, it becomes even more um, fuel used by Lenin to denounce them because, like I said, Roman never uh, uh, Lenin never backs off from Malinowski, uh, and so yeah. Um, it becomes a point of contention even between the uh, leaders of the SRs and leaders of the, of the Mensheviks who are denouncing people like Malinovsky as uh, as a Kroner agents, and Lenin stands by them 100%, and he will sooner go to war with the Mensheviks than, uh, than back off from Malinovsky or even doubt him. It's obviously only after the, after the revolution that they sort of realize. And we certainly see uh, a basis for um, the presumption that uh, organizations today would be very happy to create rifts and fissures, uh, let's say on the right, uh, no less than on the left in order to, um, you know, uh, isolate them, keep them from cooperating, um, keep them absorbed with, uh, factional infighting and all that sort of thing. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I mean, the, the undertone to, uh, to all of this is that, you know, perhaps, perhaps if, uh, if there are lessons to be learned from this whole period, if you if you suppose that um, you know all all of this is sort of going on in the present day, then you know maybe some some things about this whole process might be uh, relevant to to present happenings. But I could uh, I could not commit one um, I could not comment one way or the other on that. <clears throat> yeah, this is all purely historical. You understand, right? And spe and speculative, indeed. Yes. Um. So, getting back to uh the bolsheviks quickly um obviously everyone could kind of knows that um the uh bolsheviks and lenin in particular were helped by the germans to then get back into um uh get back into russia with a whole load of money if you right because he was uh Lenin was hanging out in Switzerland, wasn't he? Because he'd read his Marx and he knew that the revolution was supposed to happen in an advanced industrial economy, right? Which Russia at that time certainly wasn't. Well, he, he kind of had his own take and I can't remember when exactly he comes to his conclusion, but um, his his particular theory on that was that the, <clears throat> the Russian situation, the Russian industrial or economic situation was more advanced than that of uh, any other industrial economy when it comes to their progression along the uh, you know the typical Marxist track, because instead of developing their own domestic um, investor class, essentially who would um, you know be the ones that are adv that are advocating for a bourgeois democracy, um, you know that would essentially be the bedrock of what you know the, what the provisional government should have been from by by in, in the view of a lot of other more conventional Marxists, um, basically because that role had been outsourced to France, and the, and France was doing a lot of the um, the funding of the various 
uh, factories and, and whatever in Russia, what that meant is that they had a very large um, proletariat class without the um, without the roadblock of the uh, the property owning investor bourgeois class who um, ah. you know, who, who would otherwise get in the way. Very interesting. Yes, I did not know this. Yes. Yeah, so I think I think that's his that that's his reasoning. But ultimately, when when you're just looking at um, the the influence of of all the different groups who are just throwing money at Lenin and and directly helping him along the way, whether he realizes it or not, that that kind of becomes a little bit more of an insignificant point. So essentially, he he is in Switzerland, where all where all good Russian revolutionaries go. That's where they all like to hide out, and the Akrana is very aware of this. They are. Um, uh, you know, on top of the goings on in Switzerland on, uh, among the Russian Russian emigre community, um, <clears throat> at this time there is a slight possibility that they are not, though, because one of the roles that they have that I have not mentioned thus far, which is possibly relevant, though I haven't seen too much confirmation one way or the other, is that they were very much involved in counter espionage as well. So, being that the war was ongoing, they were they they you know their their um, raison d'etre was a little bit more uh, diffused, I suppose. Because not only were they trying to counter the influence of revolutionaries, um, but they were also trying to counter the influence of um, Germany and, you know, all of the, um, you know, and Austria potentially as well, and, you know, all of the all the powers who would potentially be trying to work against them in that regard. There's a few other, other quirks about the Russian system as well that make things a little bit more dis uh, difficult, like the fact that uh, Finland has its own um, police force um, because it is decentralized. It it's sort of has, it has its own state within a state sort of status. And so pretty much all of the Finnish institutions are broadly separate from the Russian institutions. Um, and so that is why, if you've ever wondered, uh, Finland becomes a little bit of a, uh, a safe haven in some, in, in some senses to, uh, for uh, revolutionary activity, and that's why he ends up go why Lenin himself ends up going through Finland is because you know there's there's passage that you can uh, like from Finland into Russia, um, but the, Rus the the Finnish authorities are not quite as interested in cracking down on revolutionaries, possibly not least because some of the revolutionaries who who would be trying to crack down on are indeed Finnish separatists. Like I said, those are one of the groups that Mojitira was funding. Subsequent to that, um, I. Again, I, um, I, I mean, it, I'm, I'm sort of getting getting to this point because what has already happened is the dethroning of the Tsar, the abdication of the Tsar. Fundamentally, I would not add this into this in, into this whole picture um, because it would be my contention that the abdication of the Tsar comes far more down to who he happened to find himself in the room with at the time. Um, his situation was fundamentally no more severe than 1905, and in 1905 he simply moved in. Uh, you know, sim simply loyalist military units were moved in. Um, order was was restored, um, you know, at, at bayonet point first, and then on that basis they were able to deal with other more <clears throat> uh, residual issues, you might say, on the constitutional side. And so, you know, once there was no longer any particular threat of losing total control of all the cities, they were able to deal with things in their own time, and thus they were able to, you know, do things like um, re-establish uh, autocratic power fundamentally. Even though, obviously, after 1905, the um, the Duma is left intact. That ends up being a bit of a problem later on because obviously the um, the Duma becomes the uh, de facto government, even though prior to that they hadn't really had all that much power. So when the Tsar abdicates, the Duma are left, you know, holding um, holding power just just because they're the the only sort of national body that would be relevant to do that, aside from obviously all the Soviets that are set up, uh, the Petrograd Soviet in particular becoming one of the most relevant. Um, one second, let me just quickly get a drink. Any more, uh, any, any questions quickly before I, um, move on any further? Uh, no, no, not at this point. I'm just, I'm just tracking with you, learning. <laughs> so, um, further to this, uh, Lenin with his, uh, with his great skill of, uh, making enemies wherever he goes, he, well, he becomes a pretty prominent voice in uh, the Petrograd Soviet, I believe, fairly early on. I think he, I think he enters enters in, but he's originally, he's initially not all that popular, and there's a couple of reasons for this potentially, and it's getting into some murky territory, because as I mentioned in the thread, um, I have heard that the original Women's March that 
uh, sort of ends disastrously in February of 1917, is actually initially a patriotic march, essentially. So, you know, much like, and this is potentially where the, the von Pleven school of managing this whole this whole situation becomes a little bit more um, relevant and where you might say it lends some credence because the management of the crowd, if you take that attitude as correct, and it does make sense in the in the frame of sort of some of the things that happen, that happen later in that um, it is a very popular position initially to stay in the war. And that is what the provisional government initially want to do. <clears throat> um, but yeah, you could you say then, okay, the, the troops got spooked or something, um, ended up um, treat, uh, treating the crowd improperly. And um, yeah, it, it, the, um, the situation sort of spirals out of control, out of control from there to the point where the Tsar ends up finding himself in a room full of people who all want him gone. Um, and fundamentally, that's, that's what it comes down to when he is abdicating. He is in a train car full of people who all are saying he potentially will be putting his family at risk if he does not abdicate, does, does not abdicate right now. Um, and he is, his hand is literally being pressed to the paper to sign the, the abdication document. So there's a lot of pressure on him at the time, and I have to wonder, you know, it's just an idle thought, but I have to wonder if he came to regret it a little bit later. Um, the accounts say that he's he's pretty happy um, in his, you know, in, in his subsequent exile, because fundamentally he's a, he took a lot of responsibilities onto himself during the, during his whole reign, and fundamentally he's he's quite a family man, and so he enjoys the time that he later gets to spend with his family without all of the um, responsibilities weighing down on him. But, you know, ultimately the way that things go are not in a positive direction, either for him <laughs> or the country at large. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was about to say that's a that's a charitable way of putting it. Yeah, so he had a brief time with his family at least before uh, they all got murdered in a basement or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think he I think he describes that as the uh, the happiest time of his life, the time that gets that he gets to spend with his family. Uh, you know, essentially in exile, internal exile anyway. Um. So from there, like I said, uh, Lenin comes back. Uh, we'll track his progress because it's it's sort of relevant to talk about the other groups, uh, and it will become more relevant post hoc. But just let's just track on to the Bolsheviks for now. Um, they get particularly embroiled within uh, the July days, which were a series of riots that took place. I think particularly in Petrograd um, in uh, 1917. So this is obviously after the initial. Um, February Revolution, but before the November Revolution, there's a sort of like a botched revolution in between when uh, he sort of like misjudges his misjudges the timing and tries to launch the second revolution. Uh, you could say a little bit early, and um, subsequently he's forced to uh, disappear off into Finland again. I can't remember if he goes any further than Finland, but he certainly runs off to Finland uh, in women's clothing, and, uh, and it's sort of plastered across every newspaper. Initially, uh, to a great deal of consternation, I suppose, to the to the general Russian um, populace, um, or at, at the very least to all to a lot of his, uh, you know, political compatriots and adversaries that he took a lot of money from Germany, and they are that the, um, you know, the Bolsheviks are very transparently funded by Germany. And, yeah, if you dug a little bit further into this, then you probably know that they're almost certainly funded by some other people besides over on Wall Street and potentially over in London as well. And who knows where else? So they were kind of seen just um, as a essentially just a you know sock puppet for foreign foreign interests, and at this at the time that was still very unpopular. But because all of these other groups, even within the Petrograd Soviet, so all of the formerly revolutionary groups like the um, the SRs and the Mensheviks, they were willing to play nice. They considered the gains that were made by the February Revolution to be you know, basically worthwhile. They may have all wanted to push further, but they were quite happy with what had been achieved so far. And so they were willing to make common cause with people like the Social Democrats, who were mostly running the show, um, especially under people like Kerensky, who, just as a brief aside, supposedly he also considered himself to be the Russian Napoleon. So um, I will have to wonder how many other Russian Napoleons there were floating around, because I know of at least one more, um, that being, because I don't think he'll come up otherwise, um, Tukhachevsky. He also thought he was going to be the Russian Napoleon. So it's at least three, and who knows how many more. Strange. Have, have Has there ever been a Brit who wanted to be the British Napoleon? Oh, I'm sure, but I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not entirely certain. Right. I think it just seems odd. Yeah. Uh, well, 
so especially the revolutionaries were very immersed in French revolutionary literature. Um, and so they were constantly trying to track the progress of their revolution onto which stage they were in in the, uh, the French Revolution. So, yeah, and they, they kind of thought, oh, actually, that reminds me of at least one other Napoleon, because they, uh, particularly from the revolutionary leftist side, they thought that a general, uh, uh, a gentleman that I'm going to bring up very shortly called uh, Lav Kornilov, uh, they thought that he was the Napoleon stand in so that, uh, you know, they, they thought it was very important for them to all get in the way of him when he was trying to launch his coup, quote, quote unquote coup. There's a little bit of a question mark over that. But uh, before we come back, uh, no, actually, that, that's probably a good time to, to get into that because it's fundamentally one of the main things that delegitimizes. That's the fellow. It's fundamentally, fundamentally one of the things that delegitimizes um, the uh, provisional government. Well, basically everybody involved with the government. And it sort of just so happened that the Bolsheviks were the most outspoken group against basically everybody. Um, <clears throat> so two things happen. There's been a whole bunch. So in the aftermath of the February Revolution, a number of things have happened. Uh, and in some ways, you could probably call it, uh, especially initially, the more revolutionary revolution, because on day one, the uh, the liberals and social democrats who were sort of the original moderate opposition to the Tsar and had sort of just been left with everything on their plate. What they do immediately is because they have ideological dif um, you know, opposition to the Okrana, they um, disband it immediately. They release all political prisoners, disband the Okrana, um, and I, they might even go as far as to make the uh, the Okrana agent list basically a, like an open an open document that anybody can see. So you uh, you, very, you get a very quick purging of, of, of a lot of different people. But I want to say, actually, I'm getting the, type, the timeline a little bit mixed up on that, because I think people like Malinovsky stay on the scene a little bit longer than that, but not all that much. But a large number of them begin to be killed, presumably disappeared or to flee at this point. Yeah. Not only that, but basically all of the, you almost get like a, a flipping of the script where all of the groups who are, uh, who are formerly very loyalist uh, come to be... Uh, crack down on, and all the groups who were formerly revolutionary are all of a sudden people who are being freed from prison and treated with the, treated with the kid gloves, uh, tacitly supported, and uh, you know all, all manner of other um, favors that are being uh, give, uh, given to them by you know people like the social democrats and the liberals. <clears throat> so it kind of fits with that uh, picture that's painted by uh, Vrangel when he you know following the beginnings of the revolution travels. Um, back into the big cities and sees, you know, that these people are all wandering the streets drunk and behaving as though they're in charge and in many respects do seem to be. Yeah, essentially. But um, in some cases, it's even more organized than that because um, people like the, so groups like the the Black Hundreds, you know, obviously, I don't, I don't think there actually was a group called the, the Black Hundreds per se. That's, that's sort of a anachronistic name that's given to, you know, a series of organizations that all operated in a similar vein. But yeah, those guys were quite often cracked down on pretty um, pretty severely. They were either imprisoned, some were killed, um, and others were were basically forced into exile, uh, along with some of the other people who had already been uh, forced into exile slightly earlier because they were opposing opposing the Tsar from his right in certain places. So, for example, some of the guys who were um, thinking who, who were essentially trying to expunge German influence in all the ways that they saw it appearing. Uh, those guys were kind of pushed out a little bit earlier as well. So some of those people are out of the picture already. Um, I mean, there's a there's a lot to talk about when it comes to the Black Hundreds because uh, I mean they they come they come to uh, influence a, a few other fairly notable organizations, and that's you know it, it's sort of parallel to what we're talking about. We're trying to focus on the Okrana and uh, and the police influence of uh, what became of Russia, but. Um, yeah, when you get to groups like the Black Hundreds, there's a whole lot of other things going on that are quite interesting. <clears throat> and the strands that you can follow there. But anyway, all of the uh, the Okrana guys are locked up, pretty much. Um, a lot of them are uh, are imprisoned. All of the former, um, like all, all the exiled revolutionaries are invited back in. And yeah, uh, essentially... Every, all the previous apparatus that was set up to control this fine, finely tuned machine, uh, it, it's all just a, a sledgehammer is driven through it in one fell swoop. And so everything starts coming coming apart very, very rapidly. Like I said, you have people like um, Lenin, who 
kind of go about the, their normal business. And so if you kind of run with this, run with this idea in the back of your head that I mentioned earlier of uh, the Bolsheviks essentially being a tool by the government um, to keep a check on the other uh, socialist revolutionary organizations or the leftist revolutionary organizations, then um, yeah, this is when the uh, the attack dog is let off the leash, or you know, however however else you want to you want to frame that. Basically, the the machine is uh, is sort of unchained and it starts taking on its own trajectory. Not quite. And that's an it, it's an interesting background point to understand Lenin's approach that I had not had available to me. You know, I had not prior to to speaking with you now, I hadn't had the context for it. But it's basically, if I understand you correctly, they they left him as the one who seemed least likely to form a coalition with anyone. And so they could count on him um, sort of uh, demolishing based on his his constitutional disinclination to cooperate um, any kind of coalition building or uh, or coalescence of uh, these various revolutionary strands. But that's pre precisely what allowed him to emerge as a single power. And he yes. ruthlessly pursued that course, right? That's basically what you're underscoring here. But there's there's a couple of other things. There's a couple of other data points that you have to hit that we have to hit before uh, we get to that point, because everybody else in the in the picture has to delegitimize themselves first. Because even in the like I said, even in the July days, Lenin Lenin and the Bolsheviks were still a joke that nobody was really paying that much attention to. Um, at least insofar as they weren't scorning him, because he was picking fights with them, and they still had their supporters. What happens, though, is the provisional government um, tries to continue the war, uh, and not only in a purely defensive capacity, but they try to con uh, continue World War I in, in an offensive capacity. Uh, and so they launch um, the, well, there's two names for it. There's either, it's either the second Brusilov offensive or the Kerensky offensive. And to understand some of the reasoning for this, uh, it's kind of important to realize that there's a lot of people inside Russia at the time especially among the elites who believed that uh, they said so they still believed in the cause. They still believed in Russia. They weren't like anti anti national anti war by any means. But what they thought was that the emperor was getting the czar was getting in the way of the war effort. They thought that he was making bad decisions. He was organizing the, you know, he, he and his government were organizing the war badly. And so if he simply got out of the way, then then like Brusilov, who tacitly support tacitly, if not actively supported the revolution to continue the war on their own terms, then, um, yeah, the war would be uh, much more of a foregone conclusion than it than it sort of already was because it was it was already going quite well for them. And uh, there's a lot of very tragic what ifs that you can get into in terms of like what was planned for 1917 had the Tsar not been removed from his position. But you know, as things was, everything was thrown into the air. So what they come up with is the second Brusilov offensive, and it ends up being an unmitigated disaster. They make a few gains in like uh, in the first few days, I think, at tremendous personnel loss, and then. In the ensuing counterattacks, basically the entire army along the uh, the southwestern front just disappears. There's like 400 men just vanish from the front. They're either taken captive or, um, you know, desert or just you know, otherwise just like basically disappear from the uh, from the rosters. And there's nothing at that point standing in the way of uh, Germany and Austria just taking a stroll as far as they care to through uh, through Russia with almost no resistance. Against the background of this, you have uh, other men who are who, um, well, some of some of the, uh, the factions, such as uh, represented by Lav Kornilov, who were again in this kind of um, vein of people who thought that, so especially within the army, who thought that the uh, the war was being obstructed essentially by the Tsar himself, not so much. Um, well, in the in the case of Kornilov, I think he also had some um, some reason to be uh, I don't know not too well disposed towards the uh, the Tsar's general policies as well. I think he was a little bit of a discontent before them, but um, yeah, he becomes a very prominent prominent under the um, provisional government because one of the other things that I haven't mentioned on the army side of things is that they. Uh, yeah, it's quite obvious, really. They they were quite far from the from the Tsarist government, and so they have to purge all the Tsarist loyalists because the mistake in 1905 was that the army stayed by the Tsar. So you know, can't be having that. Can't be having the army trying to um, all, all the loyalist officers trying to come back and uh, and rally their troops back to the Tsar, which is something that otherwise there's a good few 
there's a good few officers around who were who were strongly considering that option. So the ones that they can get rid of quietly, um, you know, just removing from command, they do so. Um, if you've read Always With Honor, then you've experienced some of that, or you've you know you've seen some of that from from Wrangle's perspective. Um, in other cases, they just send some others abroad. So I think Kolchak is one of the men who they basically sent, who, who was basically sent abroad on a um, uh, you know in, in, an international, essentially diplomatic kind of mission. And then um, you have others who are you know sort of kept in their position, but are replaced in terms of like um, who is you know who who is above them, and they and they're recourse to act within the proper military hierarchy is um, sort of maintained like that. That duty is still expected of them and many of them still abide by that. Um, but you know, the, the upper echelons of the leadership are replaced, so they're not considered as much of a threat. Lav Kornilov is one of the people who benefits immensely from, his, from this arrangement because, again, he's he had gained some popularity uh, serving under Brusilov in the first Brusilov war, I believe. Um, but he ends up being somebody who the uh, the central government thinks they can trust, and that other guy who is on uh, who, who's on the right in the car, um, you know, on Kornilov's left, is uh, Boris Savinkov. As you can see, he was a former revolutionary, and funny enough, I think he was actually one of the men who was who, who was uh, directly involved in the um, murder of von Plever to bring it all the way back around. But he's he's someone who's who's very closely brought into into the provisional government as well under Kerensky. But I mean, again, it gives you some idea about the kind of the kind of people who are being re rehabilitated and brought back into the government. <laughs> yes, fine gentlemen, one and all. Now, um, the Kornilov affair is something that I do need to read a little bit more about because I cannot get a clear picture of what actually happened, and there's uh, conflicting accounts all over the place. One version says that he was um, ideologically committed to. Um, anti-Tsarism, essentially, but what he wanted was a kind of dictatorship. So he wanted the military to be in charge of the country, and he wanted something that was a little bit more, you could say, pre-fascistic in nature, maybe. Um, you know, just military rule, that basically military dictatorship, and the military was going to run everything a lot better than the civilians had, especially in the wake of the fact that they'd messed it all up with the Brusilov offensive and, and destroyed. And I should say, one of the things that really hasn't helped with this is not only have they completely upended the table when it comes to the military hierarchy, which had otherwise been, you know, pretty well established. If, if you've got all these men serving under, potentially serving under the same officer for three years, then they'd be pretty attached to him. And then, um, you know, suddenly he's removed. Uh, you know, it doesn't, not the best for morale quite oftentimes, especially if the guy that's being brought, on, brought in is, uh, is an ideological hack who's not um, quite as proven, or perhaps has been uh, promoted for his ideological reliability far beyond his capabilities. And then on the back of that, they're being thrown into a massive offensive that, uh, you know, and in the process, they're losing a lot of institutional wisdom. So all the lessons that are being that have been learned over the previous three years are potentially being lost to the fact that the men who learnt them are ideologically, um, you know, wrong thinkers. So that creates all sorts of problems, and I have to wonder how much that played in. But um, there's a ton of things, like I said, that the that the government's act actively done to ruin our army discipline, and one of the main complaints by Lav Kornilov and the people that support him is that uh, he wants the authority again to be able to re-establish that discipline and reimpose a proper uh, proper martial well proper martial discipline again so he wants the he wants the ability to be able to give out um, things like execution for insubordination and um, and mutine mutineering and, and things like that which had been I think otherwise um, abolished. And things were much were being much more idealistically brought under a, um, I don't know, yeah, much more of an ideal, uh, an idealistic, uh, liberal, social democrat kind of uh, policy set. Like you so, so, you know, uh, grunts getting together and making decisions about what the military unit should then go on to do. These sorts uh, of things. I, I believe they literally introduced uh, elective officership. And uh, things like that as well. So, oh, what what could possibly go wrong? Exactly, exactly. So, uh, Kornilov and his uh, and his supporters, uh, so goes this line of thinking. Um, decided that they wanted to try and reimpose uh, order, you know, and, and basically impose their own version of what the revolution, the February Revolution, should mean by force, and try to organize a coup. But the entire thing is so horribly managed that it basically melts away before before it even reaches uh, Saint Petersburg. 
and so well Petrograd at the time right rather I should say and uh, and so Kornilov basically arrives there with a handful of officers and is promptly arrested um, another version says that uh, the the orders that are being given to men like Kornilov are so confused that um, you know essentially he's being given conflicting orders as to whether or not he even still has his job and so he goes directly to um, the uh, yeah to to the capital to try and find out directly what on earth is going on and uh, and that is taken as a coup attempt when in in actuality he had no intention of carrying out anything like that and you know that would perhaps explain why the whole thing was so badly managed um, there might be another theory. I feel like there is, and I cannot think what that would be right now, but essentially there's, there's um, you know, I'll come back to it if it comes to me, but essentially there's, there's a lot of confusion over what actually happened in this case, not least because Kornilov and Kerensky seem to be on the page, on, on the same page on almost every point. They are quite, from what I can tell, they are they are quite closely aligned in what they what they want and what they expect. And so the fact that these two factions are going to war with each other, especially considering the army is considered by Kerensky to be the... Oh, okay, no, that reminds me what it is. So there's another theory that uh, Kerensky essentially deliberately does this. He deliber deliberately creates uh, confusion and um, tries to um, push Kornilov into um, you know, doing something, uh, something along the lines of this coup attempt so that he can try and play the forces to his left off against the forces to his right, because ultimately the... Um, the Petrograd Soviet is a much more immediate threat, being that it's in the same city. But if he leans much too much towards the army, then the army are obviously just going to take over um, command themselves, and they're going to uh, impose their own their own version of uh, you know how everything should be run. So yeah, those are those are the three theories that I'm aware of, pr the three primary ones as to you know why why this played out how it did. But in any case, it's very confused, and it just ends up meaning that basically everybody is fairly delegitimized. The Provisional government see, uh, appears as though it doesn't really know what it's doing. The army is lo looks treasonous, and basically the only side that comes out better from this is the revolutionary, the revolutionary left, and the Petrograd Soviet. Why? Because in order to hedge off the possibility of the coup being successful, the um, uh, the provisional government actually directly arms the Petrograd Soviet. They they organize. Uh, like workers' militias and things, and you know, give them give them arms and allow them to organize into overt militia formations, and are you know allowed to run those under their own um, under their own leadership structure and their own un under their own purview. I probably don't need to explain how how this goes incredibly poorly, but at that point, once that has happened, um, and both of these factions are you know, so both the right of the uh, February Revolution and the you might say the center or the moderates of the um, the provisional government uh, uh, of the February Revolution, rather. So yeah, both the right and the center are delegitimized. Um, everybody, everybody is very jaded, um, especially on in terms of the right. The right, the right's leaders are, especially the ones who would actually be willing to act, are subsequently in jail, and it takes them a while to actually get out of jail and get back to a place where they would, you know, the, the ones that aren't are being hunted, uh, which is partly why you get you get um, the. Um, gathering of the white movement uh, and the white armies occurs a little bit more at the periphery just because a lot of these guys are trying to get away from the authorities um the center is delegitimized because no that, not that many people even supported them in the first place and the failure of the uh, kerensky offensive uh kind of like takes away what, what remains of their legitimacy so there's really only a handful of groups that are willing to actually stand by them one of which is bizarrely the um Women's Battalion of Death, which was uh, organized under the purview of the provisional government after the Tsarist government kind of, you know, didn't didn't want anything to do with it. So they end up becoming quite loyal to um, quite, to the provisional government. And they're one of the last one of the last groups to sort of stand down. But then after that, um, even even most of the groups that constitute the Petrograd Soviet and the revolutionary left have egg on their face because they threw their lot behind well, predominantly the provisional government, or at least were, were willing to make alliances or throw their throw their weight behind the war. And, you know, by extension, they kind of like end up becoming a little bit more tied with the fortunes of the military. And so, wouldn't you know it, the only group that has refused to make friends with anyone is the only one left that doesn't have egg on their face. And so 
they end up being the ones that that are, are actually able to field any kind of uh, any great um, number of loyalists. There's really only a handful of a uh, handful of people that are involved in the final, um, you know, especially a handful of units. You, you might say rather actually, but you know, really not that many people at all. You're probably talking in the hundreds or maybe thousands um, who are actually willing to uh, you know take a bullet for for the Bolsheviks. But it's a hell of a lot more than anybody else can muster at this time. Essentially, what happens um, when the um, when the October Revolution comes around, uh, the Bolsheviks, you know. State their state their intentions. They activate activate all of their assets. They're actually willing to still fight for them, and it just turns out that basically no one else is actually willing to uh, to die to oppose them. And this kind of happens in in a in a number of places going forward. Actually, we're, we're not going to get into the uh, Russian Civil War, of course, because we'll be here for hours hours and hours more. But um, yeah, uh, essentially, the Bolsheviks are the last group left that actually uh, have any loyalists, and uh, the only ones left who um, have anybody who'd will who'd be willing to take a bullet for the cause and. That's all it really comes down to. There's, there's like a yeah, and they people. control the industrial capacity of of the um, you know such as it is the remaining industrial capacity with with the big cities and the rest. And though they have to uh, struggle against famine, of course, with the population concentrations, uh, they well, that comes after they've the taken ones. power. I don't, I don't think any of these are relevant uh, relevant considerations until they've already they've already taken power. Right, right. I was I was jumping ahead to you know aspects yeah. of what enabled them to uh, to emerge uh victorious you know during the civil war so yes yes yeah yeah sure um but that, i mean in terms of their actual uh so if, if we're gonna get back to ethnic components there's a there's a funny there's a funny thing about that because uh especially in these early days the the lets uh, uh, the as in the let galens and the latvians are one of the groups that falls in very hard behind bolsheviks for behind the bolsheviks for what i would consider to be fairly you know arbitrary historical reasons and so they end up being a group that is hugely overrepresented in the uh, Bolshevik um, leadership as well. But it's them. There's a machine gun uh, company, perhaps, or maybe as large as a regiment. There's some artillery units that uh, you know they, they they become so disorganized that uh, there's there's a, a comical scenario where they bring all of their uh, artillery into position to um, you know shell the the Winter Palace during the siege where the provisional government are holed up and. Um, the, the the guns have been so poorly maintained that uh, they have to just sit there and try and find spare parts and try to actually repair the guns for like an hour or two before they're actually able to use them. And then in the meantime, everybody just kind of has to sit around and you know wait for things to happen. But eventually, basically, the the last holdouts on behalf of the provisional government sort of just melt away into the night. They decide that it's not a cause that they're willing to die for, and and that's that. The um, the provisional government's arrested, and the Bolsheviks basically just uh, take power from there. Because by that point, again, they were the only faction that had any loyalists left in the in the Petrograd Soviet. So the Petrograd Soviet took over, and then that's that. Okay, it became the government. Yes, uh, and a joyful period of time uh, opened up for what used to be Russia. There, are decades of uh, yeah pleasurable developments. So what would you say if you were to uh, cast your eye back across um, the Okhrana, uh, the things that uh, the organization attempted to do, the aspects in which it could be uh, said to have been successful, uh, the ways in which it most certainly was not, you know, these fundamental themes uh, between like a, a Zubatov versus a, a, a von Pleva, um I'm trying to remember his damn name, but yes, you get the, you know, the, yeah. the, the more aggressive angle versus the one that's, you know, give them a freer reign. Um, looking back at it, how would you summarize it uh, as this historical phenomenon, you know, um, and, and, and can you identify any ways in which it would be useful for me or anyone listening to imagine you know, that they had a legacy of some kind, you know, did they, did they roll afterwards into, did, did many of, uh, any of them or many of them, uh, or any significant number of them escape and enter service in other organizations, given their expertise? Um, did they provide a kind of template, uh, for, the organizations that superseded them, like the Cheka that you talked about, you know, all we've heard is that, you know, a few of the very specialized people um, 
got kept because of their uh, particular knowledge. Um, you know, so how, how would you summarize this and what, what do you think, uh, how did it survive, if at all? As far as I can tell, their actual um, legacy is is not particularly huge, especially not abroad, because they were incredibly stigmatized, um, both both at home and abroad. Um, so they had a Russia had a persistent problem where the intelligentsia were, um, you know, pretty liberal in their sensibilities and uh, not terribly amenable to um, czarist ideas or being pro government in in general. I mean, they had some they had some good thinkers around, but um, you know, by and large. Uh, they were not very sympathetic. And so <clears throat> I would say it's something that I haven't really brought up, but, be, but but does become a major problem. And it's sort of throughout is that the pro-revolutionary or just generally the anti ukraine anti elements are able to completely stigmatize uh, any sort of cooperation with the Okrana or, or with the government in terms of like labor organizing and things like that by labeling anybody who came to came into uh well you know help, helped helped the government in any way in this regard or helped the okrana in particular as an agent provoc provocateur <clears throat> this is obviously to deviate a little bit from the strictest definition of what an agent provocateur actually is but it was it was so successful that they could basically just call anybody who was working with the okrana a provocateur and that would be sufficient to make them a kind of persona non grata um even among people who would otherwise be you know relatively patriotic so that's sort of part of the problem, and they're never quite able to get around this. And so, as a consequence, the last thing you could expect to appear in people's memoirs uh, is, you know, a fond reminiscence of everything they learned, you know, in the Okrana. You know, you, you as a consequence, you would see, um, or you wouldn't see mention of this in the historical record because uh, during that period, there'd be so many people who would be eager to um, disassociate themselves from it. Um, yeah. And so I guess we're, we come back around to that point you made about the survival of their records in France um, being a, a, perhaps the only real reason that we even have a sense of what was actually going on there beyond the sort of lurid uh, descriptions of uh, those who came afterwards and so deeply resented them. But that, especially in the popular imagination, that would probably be the most... Uh significant enduring part of uh, the Okrana's legacy in that uh, in, a, in a perverse kind of way the um, the subsequent organizations um, that are set up by the, by the by the Bolsheviks are essentially the worst kind of caricature of everything that they portrayed the Okrana as being um, you know, so yeah, in, the Cheka in, of... in particular seem to be a deeply unpleasant uh, psychopathic almost I can't call it a psychopathic organization, but you could certainly suggest that it was an organization staffed in large part by sociopaths and psychopaths. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I think that is that is probably to understate understate the horror of the people who were running it, because uh, yeah, quite <laughs> right. a lot of them took took very personal, perverse pleasure in, uh, in actually taking part in quote unquote interrogations uh, personally. Uh, so you know, any any given um, head of the uh, the Cheka has quite a lot of blood on their hands personally, and that's quite apart from their from their other um, deviances that where you know. So, in particular, Beria is quite famously a uh, pedophile and rapist. That's <laughs> another, sort of, another fine gentleman. Yeah. Yes, probably the most Ugh. evil man in the Soviet Union. A lot, and that's counting Russia. <laughs> uh, no, that's counting uh, blah, 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 Stalin. Is what I want to say. Sorry. Yeah, someone so dirty that even Stalin eventually wanted to scrape him off his shoe. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lovely supposedly, group. supposedly he was scared of Beria. Uh, yeah, and per per perhaps with good reason, right? Yeah, he didn't uh, like him. Didn't like Beria being around his daughter. <laughs> yeah, you know far uh, quite a bit more about this than I. Um, uh, well, now I've kept you for quite some time here, and it's been a, a great pleasure um, to hear you. You know. Um, uh, hold forth on this. Um, I, I, but if I may, if I could ask one last question, this is probably going to get me in a lot of trouble. So, you know, um, uh, <laughs> feel free to answer or not, uh, to whatever, in whatever way and to whatever extent you do or don't wish. Um, but what do you make of the, uh, the, 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 the association, uh, or the claims made that it was the Okrana who uh, put together the, uh, protocols, and, um, and and why do you think that was, if indeed it was the case? 
So to my knowledge, the protocols are actually put together by uh, the Black Hundreds. Um, as to why, um, I, I think they would have basically seen it as a, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't really know how much I, how much I can speculate on that, to be honest. Um, I, I think there's quite a lot more that we could say on that on that particular issue. So, um, in particular, there are some there's some interesting sections around uh, the idea of Jews being essentially smuggled out of the empire by sympathetic bureaucrats um, and sent over to the United States, and then you know basically to to make their fortune. Um, and subsequently to that, they sort of decided, actually, the situation in Russia is quite a lot better for our ability to operate in a uh, you know free market kind of way that is less you know, less regulated than America than America is, contrary to what you may have heard or what what may have been um, implicated by uh, the various you know propagandas of both then and now. Uh, and so some of them did successfully manage to come back. Um, and then you know they, they, the idea being that they probably then wanted to try to um, well the overt reason given there, um, albeit this may be a biased source because I've only come across this story in one place, um, being that you know they wanted to act in a very predatory fashion, and this is after they'd already come into contact with uh, their compatriots abroad, and you know you might say conversed amongst themselves about you know like what uh, what greater plans there might be in store, what. Um, what their compatriots in America wanted to achieve, because uh, I think, as far as I know, Zionism, especially at this time, was more of a Anglosphere project than a, you know, one that that belonged to any of the other uh, other groups of uh, Jews anywhere else. So maybe there's just all, all sorts of these sorts of, sorts of things coming together, and uh, and they wanted to get out ahead of ahead of what they knew was sort of um, brewing, but they couldn't get it down to a single document. That would probably be the most charitable way of putting it. That doesn't just come down to straight. They were anti-Semitic. That's it. Right. Right. Okay. Well, that's it's it's certainly not something I know much about. You know, I, I I'd heard about the uh, Okhrana. I hadn't heard about the Black Hundreds. So that you know, that makes sense. Um, and in the, in the absence of any uh, knowledge on my part about the subject beyond the the most superficial, uh, yeah, I'll just file that and uh, and dig into it in future to try to make. Uh, Try to make better sense of it. I mean, from so from there... this angle, from this angle, there's a there's a very interesting. Um, I mean, I, I've mentioned it before, but when you're looking specifically at the Jews in regards to the Russian right of this time and the police services, even um, they do just treat it as basically an open open and shut case that the um, the revolution is made made up almost entirely, and the revolutionaries in particular are made up almost entirely of Jews, and they don't, they don't treat that as an open question. It's just a fact. So it becomes not a question of um, how do we, uh, you know, like determining who the revolutionaries are or like, you know, how, how do we deal with them? It, it really is just a matter of like, okay, they're Jews. What do we do about that fact? Right. Yes. Well, definitely a, um, a delicate subject to get into. And uh, probably in this case, you know, a wink is as good as a nudge rather than um, wading into it. Um, yes. Uh, so is, is there anything further than that you would w want to say about this, you know, cause you've been, you, you, you posted a very interesting, uh, Twitter thread about it. And now you, you dilated upon, uh, the subject to some extent here, you, anything further in summary about this organization? Um, any, any, anything you would, you know, you have, you have a moment to address posterity, you know, what should, what should everyone know about the Okrana that they, they, um, that most people probably don't. Okay. Um, I would say, based on everything that I've read, and to to kind of further elaborate on the question that you asked earlier. So, you know, what do we take from the achievements of the Okrana and what do we what you know, what do we take as lessons and um, and all that kind of thing? I think probably the key thing I would take from it is that even despite some of their failures in terms of, you know, how they sort of like uh tiptoed around the issue of the uh, of Zubatov's strategy and they and they then like tiptoed away from it a little bit and that sort of sort of ended up potentially creating more problems than it solved um maybe if they committed 100 in uh, to either strategy then it would have been much better for them in, in terms of like what they could have achieved because uh as far as i can tell um you know 1905 is never completely swept away 
uh, and so some of the embers sort of remain uh, and that's kind of the the, the way that it's the, the the story is usually told and as far as i can tell that's basically correct but the okrana never seem to have as good of a hold on the situation as they do going into world war one basically there there is almost nothing left on the domestic stage that can um that can oppose them in any meaningful sense um they have agents all over the place still seemingly they they control quite a lot of the opposition and they can control the direction of thought on the left the original groups that they were most worried about in terms of the srs and the mensheviks um well no, they're not concerned about the mensheviks so much they're just separating the you know getting the bolsheviks to separate from the mensheviks just because well they think it's they think it's useful to to have a more um divided and, and split and antagonistic towards itself opposition but Fundamentally, all of these groups that they were most that, that were the most violent and were the most um, troublesome for them, those are groups that lose out in the subsequent civil war. Um, and the groups that they, well, group predominantly that they support is is the one that wins out most of all. Um, so I think, in some strange way, you can say that the Okrana was ultimately in, completely successful, and they're doing this within within with the context of never having more than a thousand or so agents. They're doing they're, they're doing all of this with what is you know, you could say retrospectively a remarkably small uh, number of personnel on staff, but men who are able to essentially uh, dominate this organization to a, in terms of their skills to it, like a global degree, they are some of the best in the world at what they do, uh, probably the best in the world at what they do. Um, yeah, that was one thing I saw and I, I, I can't now remember, I was just doing a little bit of review before this just to, to know anything. Right. And uh, I do recall coming across something that suggested they had a very small budget. Like there was not any kind of large amount of money provided for these people to do what they did. Comparably, yeah. Um, and that's partly, they, they partly benefited from certain things that, uh, well, certain circumstances, such as the uh, the woman that I mentioned earlier, who was, uh, who, who, who was pract practically just paid in the joy of crushing revolutionary uh, activity and crushing the spirits of the revolutionaries and ratting them all up and getting them arrested. I'm not even sure she took any money, but. <laughs> um, right, if you really love your job, you don't even need to be paid, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, so they had they had the benefit of certain things like that, but yeah, I mean, these these people were phenomenal at what they did and even after they were formally out of the picture, the organization had been dissolved. Some of the things that they set in motion were, were still paying dividends. Um, you mentioned in passing, in, in a slightly different context, the idea of institu institutional knowledge. And I can't help but note that in the later period, especially in the Civil War, when the uh, people like the SRs and the Mensheviks um, and some of the anarchists and all these different groups who had been more deliberately targeted by the Okrana, when they come to make their play, they are woefully unprepared for it. So there's a, a situation, there's a, a a case in I want to say it was 1920 or 21, possibly as far as 22, something like that, when the Bolsheviks are still relatively early into their into their tenure, and uh, there's an uprising against them by the SRs, and essentially the Bolsheviks have no more than a couple hundred men that they can rely on, and outside. There are thousands upon thousands. It might be might be anywhere up to like seventy thousand, possibly uh, SRs. Um, you know, combination of militias, and, militia and soldiers that are um, waiting to storm Moscow and um, you know de dethrone the Bolsheviks and take over power for themselves. And they don't do it. <laughs> There's really no good reason as to why they wouldn't do it, other than just sheer incompetence or idealistic delusion that they thought that. Um, you know, maybe the Bolsheviks were going to come out and say, "Okay, fine, don't worry, you won. You don't have to kill us. We'll uh, we'll go we'll go peacefully into the night." Um, or you know, maybe they thought that once they presented this opportunity, then the the, the proletariat of uh, Moscow would uh, would rise up and give them the you know invite them in, throw out the Bolsheviks, and give them the uh, justification that they were looking for and all the legitimacy that they were looking for. But either way, they didn't do it. Yeah, yeah, I'd say that was a bad call, right? <laughs> So, Retro but you can say that was a bad call. Yeah. So, with that in mind, you know, maybe maybe you could say that the um, the activities of the Okrana in uh, you know finally cracking down fully in the aftermath of nineteen oh five worked so completely that all of the all of the original big players are completely wiped from the scene, and there's a 
a successive generation that are nowhere near well equipped enough to deal with the challenges that are ahead of them, but they found themselves in such bizarre uh, circumstances that uh, essentially victory was handed to them on a plate. The biggest thing that I take from looking more into the whole situation is just how completely avoidable it was, basically, had um, Nicholas not abdicated. That's my main takeaway, is the entire the, the system could have gone on as long as it needed to. The Ukraine still had everything well in hand. They were still in control. And for reasons that were completely outside of their control, um, it all fell apart. Yeah, it's always what you what you can't see that gets you, right? It's the one yeah. you don't see coming, which is, you know, the, the, the crowning piece of the entire arrangement, the monarch himself, yeah, yeah being removed. Strange, strange indeed. Yes, I'll have to give more thought to the uh, the Okrana. You know, I have I have a, a series of vague and disconnected images. You know, like the description of a police chief in Dostoevsky or something. You know, I've just I've never properly um, formed uh, an image of this period and and certainly of this um, police security world during this period. So this is all very, very new for me. I appreciate you being patient with my slow questions, but you know, I'm playing catch up as contemporary history, even, you know, basically any history after um, the the 17th century I'm weak on. And, you know, uh, compared to the, the the likes of a apostolic majesty or something, you know, I'm, I'm weak on all of it, um, but particularly weak as regards to this contemporary stuff. So I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to be uh, to be edumificated in some respects. So thank you. Um, are there any anything else you wanted to cover that I did not give you an opportunity to do? Um, well, what's immediately coming to mind is just uh, the the fates of some of the some of the personalities that we mentioned. So um, I can't remember oh, yes. what happens to can't remember what happens to Azef. He um, he gets found out at some point. He, he he's either uh, chased off into exile or um, murdered. Uh, Gapon has a similar fate. He gets found out, uh, and although he's uh, he's still very sure of himself, uh, sort of after uh, after he's fully committed to the revolutionary cause. Uh, there we go. Uh, sorry, I just have to throw in this bit. In Germany, Azef lived with a singer and worked as a corset salesman and stock speculator to invest the money he had amassed during his career as a double agent. He was constantly in fear of being recognized and killed. From 1915 to 1917, during the First World War, he was interned by Germany as an enemy alien. Uh, he suffered from kidney disease uh, and is now buried in an unmarked grave in uh, Fried, uh, Friedhof Wilmersdorf. Yes, uh, very undignified, but um, well, based on uh, the game that he played, it's hardly surprising. Um, Gapon, he was so. Uh, after 1905 and Bloody Sunday, he declared much more completely for the revolutionary side. But despite that, um, the uh, revolutionaries themselves were not terribly impressed by his taking money from both sides and working with both sides. So he was killed by the revolutionaries. He just sort of uh, disappears. But I think he, I think someone later yes, uh, hanged. did do his killing. H hanged, it seems. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. Well, yes. You know, he who meddles in the world's affairs seems all his life to wander down dim and dangerous stairs. Even a man of the cloth. What about the rest of them? Um, uh, what's his name now? Um, I'm, I'm forgetting his name. The, um, the handler um, for... Not Stolopin. Stolopin was uh, assassinated, like I said, by a uh, uh, an Akrana agent. There's still question right. marks over over how and why Z that happened. Um, Zubatov. Z Zubatov. That's it. Yeah. Sorry, F forgetting his name for a moment. Um, Zubatov. He when he, the moment he'd heard about the uh, abdication of the Tsar, um, he stepped into a side room and shot himself. Oof. Well, I mean, I guess he just yeah. Um... Uh, well, you can take a, that, that was a clear signal, right? You can take a very, you can take a cynical or a very, um, uh, I guess, uh, honourable or noble look at his uh, motivations for that. But um, the the more honourable being that um, you know he was he was very committed to the the czar. I think he, he in particular after he'd um, 
So, yeah, we, ne we never quite came back to him, but uh, after he was removed from his post, he was invited back a little later, but he, he decided that he, he didn't want to go back and he was quite happy to have uh, left his job, not least because I think he'd had a bit of a spiritual reawakening. Uh, I, think, I believe he was, he was um, fairly biased during the course of his work, but he was quite happy to not have to deal with all the grubbiness of it um, once, once he'd uh, sort of left the position, so he was quite satisfied with that life going forward. Um, so, you know, as a, as a pious... Uh, loyalist, then um, you know perhaps he um, he just didn't want to live in the kind in that kind of world where the Z the Tsar had been dethroned. Yeah, it does. It is sort of redolent of the idea of uh, of a of a samurai killing himself after his lord dies, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that perhaps less noble explanation would be that um, yeah, his his name would be plastered everywhere. All the revolutionaries knew of him. He was uh, he he was seen as one of the prime enemies of the revolution for quite a while, and his um, his influence ling lingered on in how the um, the Okrana was able to deal quite successfully with revolutionaries thereafter, and so yeah, he'd be target number one. So he thought he'd go out the uh, the quick way rather than the long way. Yes, choose choose his own path. Right? There's some mention here of him fearing that his uh, son's life would be threatened. So perhaps he also thought, you know, if he went ahead and killed himself, he would. Um, perhaps uh, thwart, you know, the the surge of resentment that might lead also to his son suffering a similar fate. Yeah, I think those are the main characters that we uh, we talked about that, had, that never quite received an ending to uh, to the story as we laid out. But um, yeah, I mean, there's, of course, there's all sorts of details that we've uh, that we've not properly touched on. I mean, I, I brought up the um, some of the religious schismatics earlier, uh, and that was also something that came under the purview of the Okrana to try to keep an eye on some of these religious heretics because um, religious heresies became, and, and you know, various sects became a focal point for dissension when the state was so closely tied to the church. So to be disloyal to the official Orthodox church also meant to be disloyal to the Tsar. Um, the, the two were often very closely tied to one another. And in fact, I did notice um, an, a detail that I'd forgotten about when you were looking at one of the assassins to, um, I think it might be the assassin to, the actual, the actual assassin to von Plever, possibly. Uh, I believe he came from an old believer family, which is again one of these um, one of these sects. Uh, so that kind of like you know dilutes the the Okrana's mission. Um, but ultimately, the fact that though that that as a force, I guess that that that, that could be another angle that we take actually, because of course the the Bolsheviks did not ingratiate themselves to the pious peasantry and the fact that they were doctrinally atheist. So it kind of goes it goes back into this idea of artificially propping up an organization that is opposed to everything that the um that russia naturally was now it, it was an agrarian country with a party in charge that was anti-agrarian um it was it was very orthodox and quite pious ruled by a party that was anti-religion and doctrinally atheist um you know it, it was quite russian nationalist uh, and ruled by a party that was explicitly anti-nationalism and, and would punish russian nationalism extremely harshly there's just all, all, all these things that make that make the Bolsheviks such an un, such an unnatural um, group to try and rule Russia, and yet, you know, there they were. Yes, rather, yeah, something, yeah, something to contemplate, you know, in terms of what can be forced, you know, top down. Yeah, you know, it, it can be argued uh, certainly that that such a thing's days would be numbered. Um, and it seems that they were, you know, even Stalin uh, further on in his career, as I'm sure just about everyone else knows better than I do since I haven't studied it properly. But he had to make a number of uh, changes in order to uh, keep it going, you know, and some of that gets characterized as, you know, Nazbol or whatever. But um, yeah, I mean, even Stalin himself didn't last all that long. Fairly famously, um, the, the Bolsheviks can't necessarily arrive on a... Um... On a, on a consistent platform and you can you can make all sorts of arguments as to why that is but there's there's one very intriguing um breadcrumb to i suppose leave leave all of this on is that uh, again i mentioned earlier that um anywhere up to 90 percent of the uh bolshevik leadership especially the the old guard bolsheviks perhaps even the, mem the membership i haven't really heard that clarified but you know a lot of the bolsheviks were um controlled by the okrana so uh, apparently so goes the so goes this theory it's impossible to prove one way or the other. I think at this point, the the uh, sources are probably lost to history. But there are 
a couple of people who we know for sure were definitely entangled with the Akrana to some degree. Whether that is only on paper or whether that was earnestly, it's hard to tell in some cases. And one of those cases, to bring it all back around to even the thumbnail of this, is Stalin himself. There's a, there's a theory around the, um, and, I, and I'm very uh, inclined to believe it, um, that essentially what started the Great Purge, um, and especially the purging of certain people like Tukhachevsky, who you would otherwise, otherwise think are quite useful, uh, is basically because uh, the fact that Stalin was down on paper in the records as an Okrana informant, that shows up on Tukhachevsky's desk. And so Stalin has to act first. If you go by the um, the biographies that are that are being written by, or I don't I don't think they've they've been completed yet, but um, is it uh, Kotkin, Stephen Kotkin? Uh, I think that's currently writing a a fairly extensive biography of Stalin. His conclusion is that you know one of the biggest conclusions that you can draw from the whole thing is that even in his private correspondences, Stalin is aside from anything else, he he is he's a Bolshevik, he's a communist, he's a he's a true believer, um, but. Even he was working with the Ukraina. So what do you draw from that? And I think you can take a lot of other uh, perhaps relevant uh, lessons for any 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 movement that was trying to evade infiltration and uh, being controlled by by the police from, from some of these rev rev uh, revelations. Yeah. Um, yeah, turning it even into a, a, a source of strength for a certain period, you know, that's, I mean, basically what we outlined with, uh, with Lenin, you know, where, where would he have been without that support? Nowhere. I'm, I'm, I can quite confidently say nowhere. <laughs> um, right. It's like the, the Benny Jet Jesuit, you know, there are plans within plans. Yes, exactly. But, uh, one thing that is, that I've perhaps not drawn as much attention to as I could have. And, um, well, perhaps, perhaps the biggest lesson to take from all this is, um, if you could, could uh, if you could criticize the Ukraine for anything, it would be the co the complicated nature of everything that they set up. Um, and so, whilst everything was in motion and while they were able to control everything, um, it was all very um, smooth. They could they could keep everything within their uh, within their power to influence offenses as they saw fit. They could bring people up. They could tear people down. They could uh, control the flow of movements. They could control how social um, movements are manifested they can control who takes the street and when um and what they're chanting for but that all gets to a certain level of com uh yeah complication basically that means if a part of that is altered too drastically especially on short notice then the entire the, the wheels can come off and the and, and it can explode in ways that are perhaps uh unexpected and extremely uncontrollable by the yeah, time it brings it to it it brings to mind that old story, you know, as as uh, dramatically represented uh, by Shakespeare. You know, Mark Anthony gets up to talk in front of the crowd. You know, the crowd's there for the right reasons. You know, according to the people who had um, had uh, you know punctured Caesar, um, and he says, you know, I come not to bury uh, Caesar, but uh, I, I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. You know, and yet the crowd's already been organized. The risk is there, you know, you put a, an eloquent speaker up there and he can steal a march on you, right? So by, by extension, you know, sort of metaphorically that can happen with the whole thing, right? Yeah, but uh, I mean, you know, even even more viscerally, uh, yeah, even more viscerally than that, uh, it's the example of what happens when you, when Zubatov, or Zubatov rather, uh, takes this, uh, you know, builds up this, this finely crafted machine to divert uh, all the revolutionary energies away from revolution, and then you take away Zubatov. Potentially, you know, the, the, the wheels come off and you get someone like um, Gapon filling the power vacuum who is then uh, able to channel everything in a completely different direction or, or you know, all these different movements start spinning off in, uh, in completely unexpected ways. Because if you take something like the, uh, the Minsk example of the, uh, you know, the, the Jewish uh, trade trade union, government trade union that was, uh, that was set up, um, the Jews could have been some of the uh, some of the some of the best loyalists uh, in in the industrial centers that uh, that Russia had access to because they were you know far more organized and knew the uh, the ins and outs of the rev of the revolution far better than uh, than a lot of other people, uh, especially a lot of the people who were able to field uh, you know essentially militias in the tens of thousands. Um, it could have been very useful, and uh, and it was just destroyed. Yeah. Don't know what you got 
until it's gone. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Many, many things of great value are just kind of chucked by the wayside, right? Because people don't understand uh, the context for it. Yes. But uh, uh, yeah, I should probably not be spouting um, trite um, truisms. Uh, yeah. Yes, this is definitely something that uh, can and should be uh, contemplated. I certainly will be looking at it uh, further. We're coming up on three hours, and I want to um, give you a moment to shill here uh, at the end. But before I do, I want to ask quickly, do you have any plans to be uh, looking more closely at the history of these um, uh, very, very interesting uh, Japanese uh, intelligent services that we briefly touched upon? Um, where I can, yes. I don't necessarily know how I'd continue to follow that trail at the moment, but yeah, it's something I'll definitely be continuing to try and try and look into. There's actually already some stuff around on, around YouTube uh, about that, funnily enough, with uh, various Japanese plans as to how they would uh, invade the United States <laughs> were, were that to be an option that was on the table, because they, they did have some, some fairly interesting plans that, again, came down to the same idea of rousing... Um, existing popular fault lines and, and you know, inflaming existing tensions uh, in order to make that a possibility. Yeah, I'm certainly going to take a look at it myself. I might try to um, dig up someone who, who knows more about it because it seems quite fascinating and uh, to see how they would arrange it themselves, you know, given the different cultural background um, and different, uh, you know, sort of emphases uh, in collective effort that you see there further east. I think it would be... Uh, very interesting indeed to take a look at also you know they they tend to be um intelligent and competent people you know i'm not yeah. saying at the very very top of it you know but i i think you for your general sort of run-of-the-mill japanese intelligence operative if if in any domain you could say general and run-of-the-mill about that field right i'd have to guess that they'd be highly competent anyway it's something that uh that i do want to uh take a look at in future so if you find out more about it please please let us know um and uh and uh, other than uh suggesting to everybody here that they should uh definitely go check out your blog check out your twitter check out your um youtube channel and the rest um uh, you you should have a should have a moment is there anything you want to shill here at the end uh, mostly just just uh, all of those things, I think, uh, as well as the uh, the articles that I write on Praxarchy. Those are a little bit more of an abstract nature rather than historical, usually. Um, regarding my YouTube channel, I've been uh, making sort of prom promises both to myself and others to write on uh, monarchy for quite some time because that's that's sort of one of my great um, interests. But it's it's one of those things that I've got deep enough into that I never quite feel up to the task of uh, of actually writing on it because there's always so you know I'm I'm down in the deepest trough of the uh, what is it called? The uh, the Dunning Kruger curve, where I know enough about it that I feel like I, I need to know a lot more before I can start talking about it. But yes, yeah. So if uh, if monarchy is something you're interested in, then I guess keep an eye on me, and, and hopefully I'll eventually get further into it. Um, yeah, I'd certainly, I'd certainly like to see uh, more over on your channel. I went and checked it out. Uh, you know, when you first crossed my radar, and. Uh, I was saddened to see that there didn't seem to be anything that was particularly recent. So hopefully you'll become uh, active again. Lots of good stuff over there. Yes, hopefully. Um, what else? What else? Um, I'll, I'll be continuing to research the Okrana for a little while longer. So I suppose there's a, there's a, a small chance that, um, that, that I'll uh, sort of pop back into, into your sphere to sort of flesh out this topic a little bit more if there's anything else that's uh, juicy and sort of flushes out this picture at all, because it's, well, I mean, as we, as we've talked about already, it's, it's, fairly relevant to our uh, to our present times it would seem um yeah, you'd be very, very welcome for that if there was an Okrana part two. I'd also be very, very interested if you come across anything on the Polish activities of people like uh, Piłsudski, you know, uh, in the interwar period and earlier, you know, their background. Uh, well, the, just because it's yeah, interesting. The, yeah, well, the Polish the Polish situation goes back much further because they've had a, they've got a very long history of uh, revolutionary activity. I mean, I, I kind of mentioned offhand earlier that uh, one segment of the Akrana, um refused to imp uh, employ Poles outright because they were considered in inherently um, subversive or, uh, or unreliable, ide ideologically speaking. So, um, yeah, that gives, gives you some idea of the depth of um, distaste for uh, Polish revolutionary activities. 
Yes, not popular at all. Well, um, uh, the, I, it remains only, uh, in, unless there's anything I missed, it remains uh, only, or that you wanted to cover, it remains only for me to say thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, very happy to have you on and very uh, happy to, to have you on in future if there's uh, ever anything else you want to talk about. It's been, it's been great. Um, yeah, I would love to uh, join you again if, uh, if there's something else you'd like me to, to come on and, uh, and talk about. Absolutely. Well, then I will keep an, an uh, idea on your excellent work. I hope everyone uh, here will as well. So yeah, all of you out there, please uh, go check out uh, Rupert August's channel. Please do go to the trouble to press the little button. I know it's challenging, but press the little button to follow him over on YouTube and uh, over on Twitter as well. He's got some good stuff. And as I said at the outset, uh, check out his poems over on his blog. Um, yeah, one I found uh, quite striking. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that does it for our stream uh, this evening. Uh, until next time, I am Semi Agog, and I am 